Any other questions? I had a quick question. I, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the um, the, the home that you purchased, and you said you're working with Oxford House. Yes. If you just describe the scope of activities that occur sure, there and, sure. and how it fits into your overall uh, service offering. Sure, yeah, okay. So um, um, just as a, a frame of reference, um, you know, our five county region has substance use disorder um, ratios and rates that are significantly higher than most other areas in the state of Virginia. Um, when um, I've been here now about two years in this role. Um, when we got here, one of my questions was, what, is, what are our options for individuals with a substance use disorder for supported housing? And in our five county region, there are zero. We, have, we run what's called Boxwood, which is a residential treatment program, a 28-day program. But upon graduation of Boxwood, there is no local place for someone to go who needs a continual level of support. Um, so one of the, the, the only um, recovery evidence-based practice by the federal government is what's called Oxford House. Um, Oxford House is actually a separate company. Uh, they're based in Maryland. Um, they are a peer-run, a peer-supervised um, home. So the real challenge for them, in, by contrast, Winchester as a town, I think, has 13 or 14 alone in the wow. city of Winchester. Wow. Okay. We have zero in a five-county region. Wow. Um, now we have one. Um, so the, the real challenge in talking to Oxford was Oxford homes are, are self-sufficient. The members who live there pay the rents, they pay the food. There is no public support of an Oxford okay. house. Okay. Um, but the challenge was, in our area, real estate is hard and expensive. So in order for them, Oxford to come into our area to run one of these homes, they needed really to find a rental, which is affordable, which is almost impossible, or purchase a house, which they just don't have funds to do that. And so we went out to a couple of our local foundations. We also had some private um, philanthropy. Um, and what happened was the money was given to RRCS. We went out and purchased a home that now we lease to Oxford at a very sub-market rate. And they now are running um, a sober living home at that location. And how many people maximum would be in that home? In that house, I believe that house is eight. For a five county region? Yes. Okay. Um, but I will say, that was the first. Um, it is our intention and the intention of the people that um, lent us the money for Oxford House was we, we received enough in funds to completely purchase the home. We are in the process, now it's been open, what, five, six months. Um, we will use the rent from Oxford. Um, we have a small established um, um, reserve fund that when we get that, so if it needs a new furnace or a new roof or something along those lines, we'll be able to pay for that. Once we give, get above that amount, we will reinvest in more homes. And so hopefully this is just the first event. But we are continuing to work with other partners just to open more. They, are, they don't cost our community anything. Um, and they are the best model out there right now for people in recovery. The, the statistics on people who go to Oxford and relapsing rates and those types of things are so much better than hmm. the general population. Thanks for that explanation. Did I understand that some of your day use facilities are opening back up? Yes. Okay. Um, we, we reopened um, our senior centers. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, but I was off a week, so it might be three, um, on a very, very limited basis. Um, we also reopened our psychosocial day program and our day program for adults. Again, they're all in very, you know, we, the governor's guidelines would allow 50% capacity. We're at about 20. Um, one of the, honestly, one of the biggest challenges we have is transportation, because so many of the people who use our day programs rely on us for transportation. And I think everyone's familiar with our vans. They see them around everywhere. Um, those vans can typically seat 11 individuals, but because of seating guidelines for those vans, they can only hold three. So our ability to, to bring people into services has been very small. Um, I, you know, I would also say while we've had positive um, tests for staff, we have yet to have any positive tests. I wish there was wood, I would knock on wood. In any of our congregate programs, you know, we serve very vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. We have residential programs, and we've had no positive cases in any of those. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Legraff.
Any other questions? I do. Chair Smith, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm looking at page 21, uh, the Area Agency on Aging Service Outcomes. And if I look at it the same way we've talked about these other charts, does that mean you have 41 volunteers from Rappahannock County? Yeah. We uh, have, uh, if you go back, our volunteer program is amazing. I think 287 volunteers um, in our five county region um, who, sell, who help our aging programs. Um, I, I remember last year, the dollar value of our volunteers was like $780,000 or something like that using the, the federal government allowable rates for volunteer hours. A lot of those are driving volunteers, mere delivery, some of those types of things, but yeah. And then one other question, are you seeing any trends uh, that you're concerned about uh, specifically for Rappahannock County? I would be interested. Um, well, uh, it is interesting. Um, there are no specific trends that overly worry me. I think our trend in Rappahannock is um, the fact, what worries me, I think, most is that we haven't seen a, a upsurge, and which is one of the reasons we're doing things with, like, the, the food pantry where we're, we're training. Um, you know, we are the community service board. I think for many members of our community, we're still considered government, um, even though we're a private organization. Um, and so it, for a lot of those members of our community, I think the trust issue is still a challenge, um, but they trust the, the food pantry. So we're hopeful that that will start leading to more people accepting us for services. Um, the biggest challenge that you know we've seen in locally here in Rappahannock is those members who had trouble with technology maintaining services. Um, I just heard a report actually on the drive over this afternoon. Um, our total number of clients who we have seen went down about 7% in the last quarter although the total number of like scripts and those types of things went up. So it's, it's, it's a very small decrease in the number of people that are, are being served, but I think they're being served well. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much, Mr. LeGrath. We very much appreciate your visit today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, everybody. All right, the next uh, item on the agenda is Black Bear health update, which is something that Supervisor Donahue had uh, requested. So we uh, welcome DWR District Wildlife Biologist David Koka. Kachka. Kachka. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry to botch your name. Uh, Thank you for joining not, us it's today. It's not the first time it's happened. <laughs> uh, I'm a District Wildlife Biologist with the Department of Wildlife Resources. We just changed our name. The legislature changed our name effective July 1st from the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Um, but this is my 31st fun filled year working for the agency. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So, give you a little perspective. We are a relatively small agency, roughly about 400 employees statewide. I'm one of 14 when we're fully staffed district biologists. I cover, in addition to Rappahannock County, you can't see it on the screen, but basically those teal green counties are my counties that I cover. I cover five counties. Um, and I'm de facto in covering those kind of brownish green counties because we had a retirement a year and a half ago that hasn't been filled yet. So I'm not in the county very frequently. Also, uh, same thing more or less in terms of law enforcement, our CPOs, we currently have four CPOs that are covering a five county district that they work because one of them is out on maternity leave and we had a retirement. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So, I was asked to talk about mange, what's going on relative to mange and black bears. Um, what is mange? Go ahead. It's a contagious skin, skin disease. It's caused by a parasitic mite. It causes alopecia, which is a fancy name for basically loss of hair, crusted skin, and lesions. It causes pork body condition. Mange and black bears can be broken into three different types, basically. There's, go ahead, demodic, demodetic uh, mange. There's also ursicoptes, which is basically a bear-specific form. And then lastly is sarcoptic, which is the one most people are familiar with. It's the one that's most frequently associated with uh, foxes and coyotes. It's been on the landscape for eons. There's a lot of stuff we don't understand yet about black bears and mange. 
um, but that's what we're generally seeing in Virginia. You can only tell them really if you scrape the skin and look at the mites under a microscope. I'm going to fo focus on sarcoptic because that's what we are seeing predominantly. Go ahead. They are caused by this little mite. Like I said, you have to look under a microscope. Uh, go ahead. Basically what happens is the adult more or less buries under your skin, under the animal skin, and then lays eggs, and those, lay those eggs mature under skin and eventually come out. But basically there's a variety of animals, both domestic and wild, that are susceptible to sarcoptic mange, including pets and humans. Um, your dog is susceptible to it. Uh, you are susceptible to it. Uh, several of our staff, including myself, have already had one case, but don't really uh, encourage people to do that. But um, if you have a normal human uh, immune system, about a week and a half, two weeks, something like that, they basically are gone, but it's, it's just not a whole lot of fun. And a common host are red fox and coyotes that we typically have seen it in historically. Go ahead. That's what it looks like when you're a bear and you have a severe case of sarcoptic mange. They've lost hair, they get a really crusty skin, they live a very unhappy life is the best way I can describe it. You can go ahead. So prior to 2019, we have been experiencing sarcoptic mange. You won't be able to see it, my laser won't show up there, but basically in Frederick County predominantly. Um, where, where most of our cases were. We had other ones here and there, but that's where the vast majority, and that, during that period of time from 2014 to 2018, we only recorded about 43 cases of it in those counties, but again, predominantly in Frederick County. You can go to the next one. Since 2019, we've seen about a 300% increase in those cases, and it's now encompassing about a 12 county area. Um, it's like a daily thing in terms of me getting emails relative to uh, bears that are exhibiting mange, predominantly sarcoptic. Uh, like this, this is already sort of out of date, but as of the end of July, it was 148 cases that we've recorded in that period of time. Um, you'll see that Rappahannock is one of those many counties that experiences. Go ahead, next slide. Basically, Pennsylvania has been experiencing this for over two decades in their bears. Um, and that's where it generally has been existing in their state. Um, I don't have a date of when this slide was put together, so I don't know exactly what year it was produced. Actually, one of our most recent hires worked on a mange uh, project in Pennsylvania as part of her graduate work. So she knows a lot about it, a lot more than I currently do. You can go to the next one. So basically, one question a lot of people ask is, why don't you treat bears that are experiencing this mange? Well, basically, we've done that on a very small scale. We captured several bears that had mange. We, in conjunction with the Wally Center of Virginia, we treated them. It's a very involved process. You have to treat them several times. You have to keep skinny, checking their skin for mites until they're finally clean. A number of those bears, basically, then we released. We released all of them. but. They were fully haired when we released them. Then basically what we found is a number of them basically ended up with similar or more severe cases of mange in the future, one or two years post. This guy basically was a bear that we actually caught in the county by, um, by coincidence about a year ago. We treated him, he was clean. We put a radio collar on him and ear tags and basically here we are a year, just over a year later and he has another case of mange. So it is not something we're going to be doing at this point in time. We are not doing that. It's just, it's too, it's like we're just delaying the inevitable for these bears um, and the intensity. This is a very uh, busy slide, but basically this was a postcard that was put together in Frederick County, and I believe it was mailed out through the, um, some mailing that the county took advantage of in terms of maybe it was water bills or whatever, but basically to get information out to people. The biggest thing that we recommend to people, in addition to not being legal to feed bears, is to not have them getting foods like bird feeders and things like that because it congregates bears, and hence, if one of them has it, they'll be dropping those mites and they share it with the other guys. So it's, it's highly contagious. Um, you can go to the next slide. When they get to those later stages, um, this was taken on a front porch of a house, um, not in Rappahannock County, but this is what we see. And these are bears that 
they will spend, because they're so unhappy in my mind, and a lot of this is speculation, they're so unhappy, they're so uncomfortable, they really aren't concerned about foods a lot of times, and they will spend, crawl on people's decks and their dog houses, um, under porches, um, just about any kind of st structures, whatever, and they're really oblivious to people, they don't care about them, they're not trying to hurt anybody, they're just feeling unhappy and they're just looking for a place to hang out. Um, so what can residents do if they see what they suspect to be a bear with mange is try to get some decent pictures. You can see this bear has the scaly skin on it and he's sitting there basically on somebody's front porch. You can remove any of those potential food sources. Again, it's illegal to be feeding these guys and have bears come to your bird feeder anytime. But basically, if they're hitting these foods, they're in addition to them getting rewards, they're passing potentially those mites on to other bears. And then basically, we have a, a Virginia Wildlife uh, Conflict Helpline. You contact them, send them the, the pictures, and then basically, eventually, they come to me or one of my compadres in terms of the other counties that are covered. Basically, what we do at this point is we, if we confirm that it's a bear like that, we, we either directly or we can give permission to the, the landowner basically to euthanize that bear, basically effectively putting it down and burying it. That's the best way we can handle it at this point, trying to minimize the spread of it. Again, we're trying to figure out a lot more. We're working with other agencies in the region, but also through some research at Virginia Tech to try to understand more about why this is kind of blowing up in the bear world in the past decades in, in Pennsylvania, but in Virginia in the past uh, five to 10 years. Um, and basically the next thing is if he will show, there's a brief video. Again, this will show you how uncomfortable these guys feel. This happened, this was not in Rappahannock, but this is kind of, again, a, a typical experience. This was on the day uh, Charles Orchard, Orchard peach orchard in Albemarle County, and you'll see the mangy bear, hardly has any hair on it. It is walking around all the people associated with the, the house, basically where you go in to decide if you're gonna be picking orchards, where their store is and all this, and basically there's like 100 people around there that day, and basically, of course, they call me saying, what are you gonna do about this bear? So that's how uncomfortable they feel. This guy was not gonna hurt anybody. He's just unhappy with life. So that just gives you that example. So. From there, we just flip to my slide that basically says, you can ask me any questions and I'll try to answer them. If, yeah, okay. Chair, uh, I, I kind of clued in when you said that they first appeared in Frederick County. I was going to ask the question, was there any correlating outbreaks in, in uh, West Virginia or nearby America? Yes. But then you said it was basically coming down from Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania's had it, like I said, for a number of decades. Uh, I can't speak for other southern states, but West Virginia's seeing the same thing. I just talked with uh, one of my counterparts over there a couple weeks ago. We were kind of comparing notes about things. And again, we talked about the fact that these guys at that point in time are so unhappy. And even if we try to att uh, to trap those bears, because let's say a landowner says, I can't put that bear down, whatever, it's unsafe, whatever. I can, I'll set a trap for it, but I'm having a poor success at catching those anim animals. Even that guy with the collar on, he was picked up on a camera. His the battery has stopped working on the collar at this point. He was picked on a camera on a person's property just inside of Rappahannock. And basically, uh, I went and set a trap there, and it sat there for a week, and basically the bear never came back. Plus, but a lot of them will be there, and they just don't. There's no interest in that food item that I am using as a bait. And we have people talk about, oh yeah, we see the bear, he, he has walked by your trap and the only time he stopped was a scratch. So anyhow, but the other states, I haven't reached out. I'm pretty sure Maryland is probably seeing a similar thing, but this is not, we're not the only bad place in town in terms of uh, relative to mange in bears. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Ms. Donna had a question. Um, I just saw on Facebook today, of all places, uh, a mange fox that had been picked up and taken to one of the wildlife centers and they have rehabbed the fox. And I'm just wondering if the fox is the carrier in a lot of cases, aren't we just yeah, creating I, a circle? I can't speak for the wildlife, all the different wildlife rehabilitators in the state. We do permit those individuals. I can tell you that the wildlife center, if we if we have a bear that we, in our possession that we're going to take there for some reason, 
the first question they will ask is if it has mites, basically they don't want it. And so I doubt there's, that most rehabilitators are gonna be wanting to accept an animal like that because again, whether it's a fox or coyote or whatever, they are uh, highly contagious and so they might treat that animal but at the same time, they might be spreading mites to others. So it's not, uh, not typical, I would think, that, that we would see that, but they can. I have friends with uh, pets that are outside at night a lot of times um, that are now very concerned that this is going to happen to them, to their animals. Uh, any words of wisdom on that? Well, like I said, Sarcoptic has been on the, on the planet for eons. Um, the biggest thing I tell you, if, if you've seen an animal like this on your property and it's come and, and walked past your deck or whatever like that, um, and then it ventures off and you never see it again, I would recommend there's a, um, a, a product from RAID, and I can send you the little poop sheet that we give people basically talking about how highly contagious it is, but basically it has like a 25% level of DEET in it, and it says it'll kill mites. I would recommend that you spray those areas that you are concerned about where bears have been. Um, because again, it can be passed to your pets or to you if you are so unfortunate. Any other questions? Any other questions? No, I can tell you that we did have a bear in Flint Hill um, this weekend, and um, David was kind enough to take the text with the photo of the bear um, and give the go-ahead to put it down because it was in very bad condition, and it's just heartbreaking. And it was going after the pear trees in the middle of town, basically. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, to that point, uh, I live back in Harris Hollow, close to the park boundary. We have a ton of bears. So if we do encounter one of these, what would the procedure be um, to determine what we should do about it? Contact you? And yeah, basically, like I said, the typical thing would be go through the helpline. They have an 800 number. You can okay. call them. Um, and basically, we we don't do anything without pictures confirming what we suspect okay. because you know you do have bears that, that they just naturally shed their coat in the summer right. and they regrow it so you know there's certain things we look for especially the crusty skin and things like that now if it's on private lands whatever then i can direct you to do certain things you know if it's on park service property right, right. that's their deal totally different you know yeah. so uh but Anyhow, and we share information with them. I've sent them our maps fairly recently to uh, the biologists on the Would park. Would you, um, for Rappahannock County specifically, um, my understanding is the bear population has been, and hopefully I'm right about this, has been doing pretty well year to year. Um, could you just give us a baseline for what our bear population looks like now in terms of total numbers and to what extent this mange issue will um, take that population down significantly or if this is sort of the natural course of things and it'll uh, end up with a balanced population? First of all, I can't give you X number of bears in a county. We we manage bears in kind of groups of counties. Okay. Um, let me, I'll back up. We have a black bear management plan. Uh, we revise that plan every 10 years. We're in the process right now. Um, and we do some projections in terms of populations. I can tell you that uh, most of my counties and a lot of the counties in kind of the northwest part of the state, for years people wanted us to stabilize bear populations. And basically then a few years ago, people in those counties basically wanted us to start reducing bear numbers. Okay. And so we have been moving towards that, that goal, but it's, we were only a year or two into that. And, and so we don't, it, it, it takes a while to assess that over time. Uh, I can tell you that just as a general idea, you know, the past probably five to ten years statewide, we have more, first of all, we have more bears on the landscape than we probably had since people initially got off the boat in Virginia. Um, when I first started 30 years ago, our statewide harvest was somewhere in the three to 500 bears statewide. Um, our legal harvest now for the past five to 10 years has been about 2,500 bears statewide by hunters. And then last year we killed somewhere, I can't remember the exact figure, but somewhere around 3,500 bears. So that's a function of us increasing opportunities, but also there's more bears out there. So long-term what this impact will be from mange, I have no earthly idea. I would 
I would assume that we're going to see some population impacts by that, but that's a that's a, a an assumption that we can't we don't have any real data to hang on that. Pennsylvania has not. I don't know that they've documented big increases in their bear numbers. All our states around in the east are dealing with the same thing in terms of bear populations increased, and now more and more of people are wanting them to be stabilizing or decreasing bear numbers across the states. Will will mange play any significant role in adjustment of harvest numbers or targeted harvest Not numbers? Not in the here? immediate future, okay. but that may come out through this bear management plan and through research with our uh, cooperators at Virginia Tech, so I'd have to, I'd have to defer that one for a bit. So. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a sure. really good presentation. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you, Mr. Koshka. You're welcome. That takes us to the next item on the agenda, the uh, item G1, the appointment to the Rappahannock County Water and Sewer Authority. Mr. Curry, if you would be so kind to cue that up for us, please. Uh, yes, as the information in the packet states, there is a, a vacancy coming at the uh, came at the end of July for Mr. Freitag. He serves uh, until a new um, person is appointed, um, and the the Water and Sewer Authority members are appointed by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, these appointments are not by a district. Uh, of course, they serve the authority, which is only lo is located specifically in uh, Piedmont. The um, appointments run for four years and all have an expiration date of July 31. So an appointment for uh, this position would expire on July 31, 2024. The board adopted your new policy on appointments uh, and included in that uh, was a, uh, essentially a requirement to advertise in the paper for certain positions unless the board waived that requirement. and. Uh, the, the authority is one of those uh, bodies for which uh, advertisement was required in that in that policy. Uh, so if the board is of the mind to make an appointment tonight, I would just ask you to do that. In the motion, you uh, waive the advertisement requirement uh, in the same motion or a separate motion to making that appointment. Thank you very much, Mr. Curry. If there be uh, no, no objections, I could make a motion that we would waive the requirement. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. We have a motion to waive the requirement. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Donahay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Do we have any other motions in regard to this application and vacancy? Um, Madam Chair, I had a question um, that came up. I, I had an exchange with um, Mr. Freitag over the weekend by phone. He just sold his property on Benvenu Road, and I initially informed the board, Mr. Curry, Mr. Goff, that I understood from that telephone conversation that Mr. Freitag was going to continue living in the county. I've since learned um, that his address will be on Holly Springs Road, which is to the direct south of the road that leads to the Amosville Refuse and Recycling Facility. And so I've concluded that he might be actually residing right on the line between Rappahannock and Culpeper Counties and possibly having an address in Rappahannock County, I mean in uh, Culpeper County. And so I just want to make sure that we're all clear on what, if any, residency requirements might be in place for um, for an appointee. I will say Mr. Freitag, I believe, replaced me on the Water and Sewer Authority. He's done an outstanding job. I have all interest, at least from where I sit, that he continue. He's been a huge contributor to the improvement of, of the administration of that system. So I just want to make sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure that we're not running afoul of any, any rules regarding appointments. If I could interject, there is a small section of Holly Spring that is in Rappahannock, but you're not aware which side he's going to be yeah, on? Yeah, I, I, I uh, contacted him this morning, and um, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I don't, still don't have direct information about exactly where he resides. And yeah, and I'm aware of that, too, because the line is so close. I just don't want to do anything incorrect here. Is there a residence requirement for appointment on authority? I, I put that question to Mr. Goff after looking at um, your ordinance, section 57-2, um, which is silent on the matter, and uh, track that back to the state code, which also appears to be silent on the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Goff's thought was that 
probably should be a county uh, county resident to be on one of your boards. Um, but neither of us had any code language really to get us there. Would it be advisable to just hold the the appointment until we have further information? I think that probably wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, I again, he's he's an excellent contributor, and so if if there's a path for him to continue serving just for the stability of that board, yeah, um, and we don't run afoul of any requirement that is clear yeah. on its face, then I think we ought to do it just for the sake of uh, of the folks who benefit from that authority and its work. Um, so maybe we could defer. I mean, he still resides on Benvenue Road in the interim period, so it's not a question until he moves. Right. So is there any action to be taken regarding this agenda item this afternoon? I don't think so. I mean, in, in my view, it seems that we should just wait, try to figure out exactly where he lives, and then proceed thereafter. So um, we could defer, I suppose, to our next regular meeting. Or that may be resolved by your work session that you plan to have. Sorry? It, it may be resolved by the work session you plan to have, and you could take care of it then okay. as well. Yep. Do we require a motion to table to move on, or can we just... Uh, I don't think so. Very good. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Well, Sorry to put throw... put a pin in this for now. Oh, thank you, Mr. Thank Wilson. you. That takes us to the next item on the agenda, the Sperryville Improved Pedestrian Safety and Traffic Calming. Um, this is an item that I had asked to be added to the agenda, and it's something that we had a um, presentation on at last month's meeting. I just wanted to make the board aware that I had circled back uh, to engage some of the other folks that live in the village that had not been contacted, and also to pull in uh, our planning commission member, Mary Catherine Ishii, and uh, I do intend to have something in writing by the September meeting in terms of a proposal to bring forward to uh, improve things in, in concert with VDOT. I did uh, work with Mr. Nesbitt. I contacted him several times throughout the month. Then he was able to get the speed. It's not exactly a variable speed indicator sign as you enter on 522 into the village, but it is a, a lit sign, so it definitely is more attention grabbing than your normal speed limit sign. And I did hear from some folks in the village that that did seem to be a deterrent to speeding over the weekend. So uh, that will be in place for several weeks, at least two weeks, possibly longer. And, um, and there will be more forthcoming on that at the September meeting. And uh, that's all the update. I just wanted to keep everyone in the loop. Does anyone have any questions? All right, that takes us to the CARES Act CRF distribution second allocation from the Commonwealth. Mr. Curry, if you please. Uh, very late in the agenda preparation process, we learned from the state that uh, we will receive a second allocation of funds equivalent in value to the first uh, round. Uh, so I wanted to provide an opportunity for the board to understand that and then provide direction on how you would like to move forward with allocating those additional funds. You can do that uh, at this meeting. You can uh, decide to do that at an upcoming work session. Um, wanting feedback from the board. What's our deadline? Is uh, we, there need a deadline? To, we need to spend the money by December 30th, 2020. Very good. Uh, if, if I could, Madam Chair, I hate to just keep jumping the gun here, but I, if, if I don't say something when I first think of it, I'll forget it till next week. Please go ahead, Mr. Frazier. So, uh, I, just, uh, I just realized reading uh, some of the local papers that Orange County has already decided that they're going to invest uh, quite a bit of that uh, second round of funding and um, uh, uh, broadband um, accessibility for the community and uh, I, I wonder why we couldn't uh, consider that here it may not be something that we can decide today at this meeting or how we would even do that but uh, we did take that up at the hot spot in Sperryville but we haven't provided any money for that anywhere else in the community so there, there's that and, and I think Orange is also con contributing directly from their board somehow directly to the fire departments they're not using some uh, third party to do that. Uh, they certainly certainly can provide to the fire companies for public health matters, and I'd be happy to reach out to Mr. Voorhees and see uh, his strategy there. Uh, regarding broadband, Fauquier is investing a significant amount of money into broadband as well. Um, both Fauquier and Orange had well-established 
programs, so public-private programs already in place, and um, those vehicles were readily available for investment. Our problem is we don't have that public-private uh, agreement yeah, I, in place. I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up, but uh, I just wondered if maybe we couldn't enlarge at, at immediately upon the hotspot idea or, or something, because certainly it's not enough money for fiber optic burial or anything. Yeah, I I'm, uh, saw some correspondence today regarding the hotspot, and um, I think Sparable Community Alliance is um, walking that back some because they're not quite ready for it. So the board may have to reallocate those funds as well. Oh. Just an idea. It's a great idea. I, I would love to find a way to effectively invest dollars into expanded broadband internet for citizens. Absolutely. I'm just grasping at how we can make that happen. Not not due to the rules, but just actually find an investment partner that could do it. I wonder if the size of a program like that would be something that uh, the regional commission would be willing to take on for us. They might. The, the biggest issue is probably timing in December 30th. And, and that could change with the federal government. We don't, as they're negotiating round four, uh, they could reach back and modify the rules for the CARES Act, and I note that in the narrative here. Um, they, they could change the deadlines, they could change the prohibition uh, to use the funding for revenue replacement for counties, they could do any number of things. Um, so um, the board could allocate all these dollars or try to hold back, but there's, there's risk involved because you definitely want to have them invested in time so they can be spent uh, by the time we get to December 30th. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Whitman. Um, you and Mr. Curry did an outstanding job, I think, with our uh, recent CARES Act allocation related um, special meeting and um, moving it along and focusing the discussion. I think it also gave a targeted format for interested parties to come and speak publicly. Um, I wonder if we couldn't take a similar approach here um, because at least for me, it was a huge benefit to just be able to focus on that single task in one session and then letting the public know in advance that the, our discussion will be limited to that one task of allocating CARES Act money. And it seems like the timing described expenditures by December 30th would still allow us to do something like that during the month of August and move this along in, in a way that makes sure that we don't miss an opportunity to spend what's been provided to us. Uh, at the pleasure of the board, I know yep. the board is is uh, hoping to schedule a work session for August for building mm -hmm. uh, matters. Uh, maybe you want to reshuffle the deck and do this instead of that or have two work sessions. Uh, we just need to have enough time to notice meetings and make sure we have a venue. What's the, uh, what's the schedule for the building related discussion? Is that uh, set yet? Or? Uh, the intent, I believe, was to have that be in the third Monday, the 17th. Okay. Um, and that's a topic as we get to the uh, end of the agenda with how you end this meeting, whether you recess it to uh, that date, time, place specific, or... Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe that there's a lot of information that we still have to gather as to how to spend this money. I, I think if there are uh, needs of working families, parents that have two... Uh, parent, or families that have two parents working outside the home, and we need to figure out some childcare option for those families, I think that should very much be a priority as well. Um, I think broadband is, would be a good use of the money. I think the other thing we've got to figure out is how to get this money directly into the hands of our fire and rescue companies. Uh, yeah. I, I think there's got to be a creative way to do that. And uh, I don't know what it is, but I, I think we need to find it and figure it out. Yep. Because they are hurting. They are not okay. Might I suggest that we, would it be possible for the work session that's already contemplated to make this the focus of that meeting and shift the building discussion maybe to the fourth Monday of August? Very reluctant to do that because uh, Wiley Wilson has already committed to that date that they're available. Okay. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that all the facts that we need to have that discussion will be in order at that point. So. 
Um, I would like to take it up at the September meeting, perhaps, but if there, if it is all together earlier, um, we could have a special meeting or another work session and, and go through it at that time. Are there certain tasks or questions you would like me to attempt to answer between now and then? I'm, I'm really having a hard time getting a, a handle on how other counties are, are seemingly finding ways to get money to fire and rescue, and that seems to elude us. Well, we, we definitely know we can do it through small, for, for revenue replacement, for a business interruption, we can do it through small, uh, small business grant program. We know that. For public health matters related to PPE and uh, cleaning and things like that, we know we can definitely do that. I'm just not confident and haven't talked to anybody else who, be, who have shown me that you can provide revenue directly to a VFR for business interruption. But I'm very willing to ask further and broader and wider. Well, I hear that Madison County has taken on some things that are very inventive, uh, and it seems like maybe Orange County has as well, in terms of uh, broadband in Orange County, but uh, fire and rescue in Madison County. So I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm just haven't heard the full conversation about how these other counties are able to do things. As some are buying uh, public safety radios, for example, um, you could probably get there if it's a county asset and it helps. It has to be you know, directly related to COVID and we probably could make that case. Um, but all of us, uh, there's risk involved and at the end of the day, if the auditors don't believe that you follow the rules, then you might be giving money back. And so as long as we're, we understand the risk um, and we think it's worth it, then we go forward. I think uh, to Mr. Frazier's point, maybe it'd be worthwhile just to get a summary of, um, of specifically how Fauquier County, and you mentioned Orange County also on the broadband yeah. front, just to understand um, what the mechanisms were for them to be able to feed money into their systems so that we at least know what it looks like once you have some kind of utility or authority established for broadband purposes? Uh, broadband, Fauquier has, uh, already has a relationship with a provider. They already have a, a program where they sub, Fauquier subsidizes that provider on a new tower and they're they just have accelerating an schedule. They already have an authority. And, the, and they have agreements in place. They're just the schedule was for five years. They're just cranking it up, pulling everything forward. And Mr. Curry and I uh, were on a phone call with Richmond early when the CARES funding um, started, and trying to find out a way that these funds could be used for broadband. And that's that's the problem we're running into. As they were telling us that um, if it was something to do with COVID, and something you could do quickly with that was a COVID-related issue, then it was usable, but to start a brand, brand new broadband program, not so much, okay. unless it's changed. Any other direction? One question I have, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Patrick Finn with Wakefield County Day, or Country Day School I met for the first time today. And he, as you see in your packet, brought some um, numbers of issues that their school is having to deal with with regards to COVID. Um, I don't know if it makes sense for Mr. Curry to research non-public um, schools, so the private school side of things for funding. Um, obviously, we have m many or multiple in the county uh, that could potentially need some funding as well, just with regards to COVID needs. It, it, that's a very interesting question. It's it's a nonprofit, like many other nonprofits that we have, and we're confident that they could receive funding through a small business grant program. Can we directly fund any nonprofit for other reasons? That's a it's a very good question. And does the fact that this educational that's also a very good question. Madam Chair, do you mind if uh, Dr. Grimsley speaks? No, please go ahead, Dr. Grimsley. 
Would you use the microphone, please? Uh, yes, through the Public Schools CARES Act funding, um, you should have received a uh, letter about set aside funding for specific COVID related expenses in a private school setting. Um, so that can be used uh, that way. So we do have a set aside for our private schools, kind of like your equitable um, set aside for the county and um, the city of Little Washington. So the town of Little Washington. So the similar uh, process works for us and we have meaningful federal program consultation to have set asides for most of our federal programs that way. So if that helps. So if we wanted to engage us, we could do it through the, the public school system. Is that what you're saying? I would start there because there's specific criteria that it has to reach. And that was the intent of the school cares act to also provide some aid to some of our private schools. Yes. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Anybody Thank you. have any other questions? I guess my other question, Mr. Curry, is if there's items that we chose to fund the first time around that may not come to fruition, what happens to that money? I, I think it's subject to be allocated. It's no, no money has gone out the door, so to say, uh, to any business of Rappahannock or Sperryville Community Alliance, for example. Um, we didn't talk much about the logistics, but because of the, the strings attached to all of this, uh, we need to be very careful and make sure that we have either agreements in place or it's on a reimbursable basis. So um, I would say if it's not spent, it's available for some other purpose. Do you think that um, something like the lighted sign that's now in the village, uh, I mean, we did have to ask VDOT for several of those early on. Um, and depending on how things unfold, they may be useful in the future. And, and most, I know Culpeper County has some of those and they um, light them um, with different messages. And um, I wonder, is that something that would be able to be covered with the CARES Act funding? I, I have seen others do that and I don't see why it wouldn't be, particularly if you're doing it for a COVID-19 reason. And then you can use it for anything in the future. But. And, and knowing that as odd as it is, that speeding is actually up all over uh, due to roads feeling emptier, would you be able to use CARES Act funding for any traffic calming measures? I think that's a bit more of a stretch, but. I'm willing to, sometimes it's yeah. good to stretch. Yeah. All Thank right, you. seems like a no. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I would say the guidelines and the frequently asked questions continue to be updated. So uh, as we go through time, those documents which are linked in the in the uh, agenda item under board docs, um, every couple weeks or so, those are getting updated with some more um, definitive answers. So things may become available or are understood over time that we don't think are acceptable now or vice versa, and we'll just have to keep watching that. I will say that from the equitable um, sharing part, the town probably should get their equitable share of the next tranche. And so that'd be $8,000 in, in the table that I attached. I, that's the only thing I showed in that second column uh, for that second $640,000. Would it make sense to reach out to all the stakeholders uh, like we did the first time around to see if they have any different needs? Uh, sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. How does everyone feel about that? I'm fine. Might be a good launch point for the discussion. Thank you very much. Anything else? All right, that takes us to the next item on the agenda, new business, the REC Board of Directors proxy vote. Um, is there a motion or any discussion in regard, or actually, Mr. Kirk, could you talk a little bit about this first, please? Sure, as uh, board members are aware, um, most residents received in their mail a document that looks kind of like this and encourages uh, the member owners of the cooperative to voice their um, position on who to vote for for the upcoming REC board elections. Um, by virtue of having accounts, the Board of Supervisors has the opportunity to do that. Um, 
staff didn't want to presuppose how you may want to vote. Uh, two of the three regions are there's unopposed and there's one that has opposition, uh, an, in, an incumbent and then a, 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 a new face uh, looking to come in who may be more sympathetic to broadband. Uh, so staff would be happy to fill these documents out to reflect the wish of the board. Or you just give me general direction and I can go back and interpret the positions based on that and complete it. Do any of the members of the board have an opinion or wish to make a motion regarding this agenda item? Yeah, I, we've never had this before. I'm sorry to... No, go. I guess we've just kind of ignored it, but... Uh, this is the first time they showed up in the mail to my office, which, uh, well, in a couple years, right? So, yeah. Um, surprised me, but it made sense. I got one at home and then it made sense that I got them in the office, too. Well, I, I, I don't know the gentleman personally, but I... I think Mr. Sanford Rees is a very well thought of individual in the community. And he served Culpeper County for, uh, it says 28 years. I didn't realize it was that long on the planning commission. He's the current chairman, but he's very, very well thought of. Is that a motion, Mr. Frazier? Well, I can make it a motion, but I, I just thought I would say that. I, I, I do not know him personally, but I think he's uh, got a fine reputation. So I put that in the form of a motion at the board would uh, entertain it. And what's his name again? Uh, Samford Reeves Jr. is the name of the gentleman who's currently the incumbent. And uh, the other gentleman that's running for this, the only contested seat is Sam Heald. Seth. Seth Heald. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So is the motion to support Seth Heald? No, sir. It's to oh, support Sanford Reeves. I'm Sanford sorry. Reeves Jr. Oh, I would personally like to promote uh, Seth Hill. I've heard about him and uh, been not contacted by him, but other people that know him and recommend him because uh, he is uh, interested in the broadband and the solar energy and the stuff that's going to, you know, help, uh, help. I think he's progressive. Well, we do have a motion on the floor, and so I will second that motion for purposes of discussion so we can clear that motion before we take any other action. Um, so it sounds like uh, you wanted to make some other comments, Mr. Parrish. Well, first of all, the motion is for what purpose? To support uh, Mr. Samford Reeves and his uh, run the, as an incumbent. The incumbent as a, as a board. Yes, sir. Okay. I think it's Mr. Curry's got three votes because of the electric in the company or in the county um, that we have as a, a business so it's not really it's not the board voting if I understand it correctly it's just you're voting your three how many votes do we have Mr. Curry it, turns, it appears we have four actually four. So, yeah. based on what I would imagine the number of accounts that we have is that we correct? we have a lot of accounts but um, we've recently combined them into some master billing, so I don't know if that has anything to do with why we have four and not 20. I can say it is my understanding that Mr. Held is uh, pro-broadband and the REC uh, board um, hopefully approving to move forward with the broadband initiative, uh, whereas I do believe um, Mr. Reeves was it Mr. Reeves that just sent out the message that said they're not going to do broadband, they're going to refuse to do broadband, it's not something that REC should do from a fiscal responsibility standpoint? Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe it was Mr. Reeves. I, I don't know them. I, yeah, I saw that. It was, it was in the Rappanic News. Or, yep. yep. Isn't REC doing the fiber build out though? They're building out fiber for their own purposes, but they're in a process right now where they're evaluating whether they should build out fiber to the home and uh, whether, and I believe they are seeking um, rural digital opportunity fund, RDOF funds RDOF. from the federal government uh, to have a major investment of dollars to help make it more cost effective. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any further discussion? 
The motion and the second is for the reappointment of Sanford Reeves Jr. Using uh, how many of the votes did you intend to send his way, Mr. Frazier? I don't know. I guess it wouldn't make any sense to split them, but I guess all of them. Right. I, I would just like to say before you call the question that uh, uh, I know that this repower group has uh, got ties to uh, the West Coast, and, and I don't know that we need that type of thing to be interjected in our local cooperative. Well, as I recall, none of the repower uh, candidates won their seats last year. I think they were all defeated. Yeah. And, and I got quite a few uh, postcards from California that I have to say left me with an uneasy feeling. Yeah, they, they've got connections to some bad places. Any further discussion? All right, well, I'm going to call the question then. We have a motion on the floor to uh, allocate all four of our votes to the incumbent, Mr. Sanford Reeves, Jr., Mr. Frazier. Aye. Ms. Donahue? No. Mr. Whitson? No. Mr. Parrish? Nay. And I also? I vote aye. So sorry, that's always confusing, Mr. Curry, and I'm trying to fix that. All right, do I have an alternate uh, motion for this uh, agenda item? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion um, based on the support of the broadband and the need of Rappahannock County with broadband for Seth Held uh, to receive our four votes. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. We, we are aware of his left coast connections, right? Aware of what? The, the, this this gentleman is 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 a uh, he's 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 aligned here with Piedmont Environmental Council, but that repower group is is connected with people out in California, which are not in tune with the people of Rappahannock County. I don't know about California, but I've been. He's been he's been highly recommended by people that I whose opinion I respect. So are those people in line with the people from California or people right I know of. <laughs> I, that, I mean that's that's my one of my greatest concerns is right. that he's he's part of a group, he's the co founder of the group, and they are they are uh, entwined with people from California. I mean it was a very orchestrated, almost political campaign. Yeah. I don't know about California. A long ways away. <clears throat> All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Frazier? Nay. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Parrish? Aye. And nay for me, please. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Takes us to the next item on the agenda, the 2020 state legislative priorities. This was an item that I requested Mr. Curry to please place on the agenda. Um, it's uh, evolved from my uh, sitting in on what would normally be the VACO Regional Conference uh, the other week, last week. And um, one of the things that they asked for in the course of the call was that we uh, send them a list of our legislative priorities for our county. Um, it was a very interesting format for the call because it, it wasn't Zoom, but it was a similar platform, electronic platform, and they actually had more people participating in the regional meeting than they've ever had in person. They had like 85 participants on a call, on a Zoom meeting. So that was very interesting, and um, they did ask that we put together what our normal priorities are and, um, and enumerate them to the... Uh, VACO office in Richmond, in particular to uh, Carrie Walker, and I furnished Mr. Curry with her email address. Um, in reflecting on that call, uh, as you can probably imagine, what I think are our priorities are, are very different from a lot of the other participants in VACO, but I did think it was an important opportunity to make our priorities known to VACO, and I didn't want to let it uh, pass by without uh, turning in a submission. And I'm certainly welcome to other, um, I'm certainly open to other information, but I, I did suggest we prioritize uh, in a letter to uh, Carrie Walker at VACO for Appahannock County, the issues of rural broadband, 
the concerns over our local high composite index computation for our public school system and our continuing COVID aid and response for our county, our schools, local businesses, and our volunteer and fire rescue companies. And uh, I, I guess I would like either a motion or further discussion on this item, please. Mr. Curry, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, uh, if there's a letter to be written, I would just uh, want some direction on how that's going to happen and who's authorized to do what. We will do that. Thank you. Is that the mechanism by which um, we should inform VACO of our priorities? Is it just by a letter? Uh, yeah, generally, VACO will develop a whole platform. In order to develop that platform, as uh, Chair Smith noted, they want to hear from their members. Uh, that platform ends up being pretty thick. And right. then once that's done, you may be in a position to take another stance later on what portions of that platform or otherwise uh, this board supports and then send inf uh, that information to our state representatives so they know how we are thinking as they're getting ready to vote in Richmond. Okay. Yeah, Chair Smith contacted me outside of the meeting, I believe by email, and asked if I agreed with those uh, legislative priorities, and I did. I think those are obviously the hot topics for us. I, I have nothing to add, and um, I'd be willing to just uh, make a motion that we direct uh, County staff to prepare a letter to reflect Ms. Smith's uh, identified priorities here and, um, and send it to VACO as soon as possible. I don't mean to interrupt when someone's agreeing with me. It's a very bad policy to take up. But I, I did also just have a thought that um, as much as our comprehensive plan uh, emphasizes agriculture, we should also include um, that sentiment in our letter as well, especially uh, in differentiating um, uh, U.S. raised <coughs> beef and products versus foreign products, and uh, that we need that edge for our local uh, farmers. What is also, the, is that the country of origin labeling stuff? That would that would yeah be the gist of it, the same kind of idea, um, but just basically uh, whatever we can do in terms of branding and education to uh, give our local agricultural products an edge in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So you would add that? I would. Yeah. I think that would be appropriate and um, just occurred to me, uh, but I, I do think that that would be an, an excellent addition. If you would be willing to amend your motion to that effect. Sure, I just, I'm trying to think of what the description of that would be. Uh, the board has re previously sent uh, letters right. on cool and right if that's what we're talking about yeah that's easy we could just I think Miss Smith and I both worked on that um, early on in the year so but yeah I appreciate you attending the call and I thought you, you hit all the hot spots so um, I'll amend that motion to include uh, country of origin labeling as another um, legislative priority to include to add to the letter thank you very much mr. Woodson uh, I have a motion on the and the, uh, the mechanism that I believe would be in order uh, per the call the other week would be uh, an email to Carrie Walker at VACO. Is that enough? Uh... I think we would probably write a letter and attach it to an email just to give it, uh, okay. to make sure it's very clear. Um, and I would prefer that the chair sign it, um, even if staff prepares it. I think that gives it even more. I'll be happy to sign it as well. So it will be uh, via a letter uh, attached to an email and, and signed by the chair. And uh, I would be very happy to second that motion. Is there any further discussion? Madam Chair, if you don't mind discussion wise, um, I'm wondering if because of the situation with our volunteer fire and rescue and the need upcoming need for paid, um, if we should pull it out of the COVID line item and make it a line item of its own. I don't disagree with that. I just um... and I would want to know what what action are is the Board of Supervisors requesting of the state um, that would help support volunteer fire and rescue. And ultimately, you're at you are advocating for um, the General Assembly to take some action and the governor to support that action that will have an end 
related to these items, and I'm not sure what what that is for volunteer. There may be some some good point. Well, I mean, I think if we want to get down to the nitty gritty and pull out volunteer fire and rescue, you know, what sort of is eluding us is, is direct direct payment capabilities to volunteer fire and rescue companies for shortfalls in revenue and you can due to do COVID-19. Yeah, you can do that as a board right now, uh, but just not with the Federal CARES Act right. dollars and our state legislature doesn't have the keys to that kingdom. Uh, there, it, and our state uh, is to be commended that of the money that was set aside by the feds for state and local governments, Virginia is one of the few that have sent the most on through to local governments. Well, I, I think we have it pretty sufficiently dialed in to, uh, to send this letter, and we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, if we need to, we could we could regroup on this at the work session. Uh, Mr. Fraser, how do you vote? You have a second. I thought I seconded yes, it. Yes, oh, you did. Okay, sorry. Uh, aye. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. Aye. Mr. Whitson. Aye. Mr. Parrish. Aye. And I also. Thank you. Um, consideration recommendation of the ordinance changes for family divisions, nonprofit events, and temporary structures. Uh, this is something that I have requested to be on the agenda. Um, these are some things that we discussed at the at the last uh, board of supervisors meeting at the beginning of July, uh, sending down to the planning commission, and there seemed to be a consensus at that time that we send down the um, possibility of uh, increasing the family division. And taking a look at the nonprofit event structures. And then it's also been brought to my attention uh, in my district in particular that there's a there's an issue with the temporary structures language. Um, things are considered temporary structures, but they've often been up for years. And um, it's, it's turned into a real nuisance in at least one situation that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, and so I was requesting that we send that language down to the Planning Commission as well and, and ask them for further clarification. Um, just in, as an example, I know um, at one point I was talking to Ms. Summers about trailers and there is, a, there is some language about you can't live in a trailer, I think it is for more than two weeks if I remember correctly, unless you're like the trailer park manager or manager of the campground. But if your trailer is on private property, uh, you can live in it for however, there's, there's no limit to the time period that you can live in it. So it just seemed counterintuitive mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're looking at it in some instances, but not in others. I think it's a great one. I mean, I'm aware of the situation you're describing, and I understand you've been working really hard to try to figure out what's going on there. And it's, uh, if you've seen it in person, it definitely raises questions of whether our ordinance is working in that regard. So I definitely think that's great. Well, that, that particular instance is like trying to hit a moving target at this point. But uh, I, I think the very least we can do is, is send down the language and, uh, and hopefully improve it so that other people don't encounter this issue in the future. Yeah. Um, so I, I would just make a motion uh, if there's no further discussion, or there can be further discussion, that we send these particular items down to the Planning Commission to look at these sections of the um, zoning ordinance and, and uh, see if any changes or more stricter guidelines would be uh, advisable. Uh, I can make a second, but I have an addition if we could make one. Okay. There's, there was a, 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 it's really just a typographical thing, I'm sorry. Sometime back, maybe five, eight years ago, we, you've got a, a corresponding language both in subdivision ordinance and the zoning ordinance, uh, and it was changed in one and not the other. And and what happened was, and, and I don't want to call any names, but Mr. Parrish would know both of the, the individuals I'm talking about, you, you can only do one subdivision per year, even family divisions, or, or actually this family division rule, rather, and if you had more than one child, you would have to wait a second or third year or whatever. But the problem was, if, if, and that is so that if this piece of property, the parent property has already been divided and I own part of it and maybe one of the other members here would own the other part of it, somebody else could get a subdivision. But these two particular properties, 
had not been subdivided by anyone prior to 1962 or since then, so it didn't affect anybody else, but they were under the rules of our, our zoning ordinance and subdivision ordinance that they could only make one division per year. One of them had two children, one had five, I believe it was. So the board at that time saw this as a problem that didn't need to be there. We changed it, but it only got changed on the zoning side. I believe it's still in the subdivision side that you can only do one per year. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back and clean that up. It, I don't know how it got missed, but it got missed. But it's, it's, it's just a, really just a technicality, but it would have to go through the proper process now. So I would revise my uh, original motion to, to include that as well. Family subdivision language, I believe it's in 147. Yeah. We, I believe we were able to change it in 170 properly, but we missed it somehow in 147. And that's probably included in the first bullet. But the one thing I would want to have clarity on is um, we've listed here in the uh, agenda the relevant right. sections, but if you're what wanting to nudge them in right. a certain direction, I want to make sure that's clear when I pass this on to the Planning Commission. Has 36 B. B. Well, I think that, as we discussed last time, the family division, I think we want to, well, I think it's appropriate at this point, since it's been the same since the 1980s, that we look at increasing that. Um, I hear often from Native families that would like to have other um, family members come back and, and live on the land with them. And if you're talking about how do we have a little growth and control it, I think that that would be an mm -hmm. excellent way to do that. I can give you the text where it's at now. It's 147. 36 B and it's B E D. D. Yeah, it's on the screen. So that that it got missed somehow. Yeah, and, and for the life of me, I don't understand why any of these rules are in your zoning ordinance at all. Um, they should be in the subdivision ordinance. But we had one in each, I guess, just so that it why, could be tracked properly. Why you'd have subdivision ordinance language in your zoning ordinance? I I don't know. I was. I missed that night. I say you, but it's we but <laughs> from the past. Are we in discussion, Madam Chair? I, didn't, I don't know if we've had a second. Uh, Mr. Frazier second. With, with that change, if it was acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Yes, please go ahead, Ms. Donahue. I've just been thinking with the aging population in our county, if it would be possible maybe in the family apartment um, for the family division to actually have something specific to a caregiver um, so that if you are um, single or have lost loved ones and now don't have anybody else to look out for you, um, an apartment or our definition of an apartment would be okay for a caregiver as well. Uh, we have that under, I think, uh, but it's a smaller unit, but I think that's under... Uh Oh dear. I thought it was built kind of built into family department the way no, that's worded. No, family worded. apartment is, is family yeah, apartment can be your cat sister's grandmother. <laughs> so, it, but the thing is, uh, I think it's under um, in the apartment for uh, you can you can, so you can apply for an apartment for caretaker, but it's a smaller unit. You can expand that, I guess. Just family and caregiver apartment is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. We could, we, could, we could take a look at expanding that. And Madam Chair, I really I like your focus a lot on the family division provision. One question I had, I heard some time ago, and I, I don't know that I fully grasp how it would work, but there's that time clock um, language related to family division. I thought that might be part of the focus of any possible revision. It had to do with dividing a master, maybe you know, or Mr. Frazier. Five lots since 1962 for family divisions. And what does that mean? I mean... 62, it's just a magic number. It's, it's, you got to have something to track it to. You can't just pull an arbitrary number out. So that magic number coincides with our first, Rappahannock's first uh, mm -hmm. subdivision ordinance. Okay, so what would the effect of changing 1962 to some later date be? You'd have to... Be able to tie it to something like Mr. Luke said when he was presenting uh, something to the board one time that you got to have a date certain that you can make an argument on. So it would have to tie it to something like maybe you could tie it to 1989 or 
I guess my question is, I had understood that one way to kind of relax what's very restrictive now based on that 1962 date, that that date in some way could change, which would then well, liberalize that. I don't know why you would want to change the date. You could change the number because the date would make okay. a good argument. So 1962 is the first okay. subdivision ordinance. I that, would suggest that, that um, so instead of five, you could go to seven or nine or 27. Planning commission's in place to kind of work through the sausage making process and that if uh, you want to convey to them that you want to increase opportunity for family divisions, they go sort it out and Mr. Frazier can carry to the body the intent of the board and then without specific language, you wouldn't be passing something to the planning commission for them to review within 100 days or something right. like that. This would be put this on your long list of ordinance amendments that, that you right. want to do and, and oh, by the way, if you modify an ordinance in this way, when it gets back to us, you know, we may look favorably on it. I believe you and Mr. Henry in particular have a good handle on this, so you certainly would have be able to wrestle with it without specific direction if if the intent is clear. I, I think we can. I think the intent's clear. There's, I've, I've gotten stopped. I haven't really gotten any email that I can remember, but I've been stopped out in, about the community where people really, really think it's a good idea that we take a look at it because Let's face it, most of the people we have here are pretty good people, yep. and we kind of like them to stay. So for nonprofit events, uh, what, what would be the, uh, how would we want to modify what is currently handled? We happening? talked about this a little bit last month, and, and uh, I think it came up in, uh, in relationship to uh, events that have been going on out at Eldon Farm, and that I had received feedback from some of my constituents that uh, in comparison to the way Mr. Fletcher brought forward his special exception uh, at his field there uh, outside of Sperryville, um, Eldon seemed to be pairing with nonprofits and using that sort of blanket opportunity to get a permit to hold an event there. And so I think the concern is that um, by making it an automatic permit, if you have um, a nonprofit buy in, then you're sort of not having any control over how many events happen at certain places in the course of a year or two. Um, I would be um, wanting to drill into details like limiting it to a certain number either of events per nonprofit or a certain number of events per venue um, so that it didn't just become a, you know, a pro forma thing that folks used all the time. Is that enough instruction, Mr. Curry? Um, so to, I guess what I'm hearing is you would want the Planning Commission to review the um, permitting process for nonprofit and for-profit events and to more closely align the two? Yes, I'd say so. Um, that your uh, fire department fireworks and things like that. Right. I, I don't mean for it to be overly burdensome for those departments who certainly I think that language has originally been crafted for, which if it's, you know, usually it's just a two events per year is the most I can think of for any company. So mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, two or three events either per nonprofit or per venue would be appropriate. But just uh, the blanket permit process, if you have a nonprofit tied in, uh, seems like it will, could potentially be very problematic. Right. Well, a lot of the nonprofits uh, have events to raise money for causes, you know, within the county. We wouldn't want to restrict them because they raise money for, uh, and the Planning Commission can figure all this out. They know that. Uh, I just don't but, think there's very many of them that actually require a permit. Mm -hmm. That do that, I can think of very few. But they have the CCLC and the Headwaters and the you know uh, Rapcats and you name it. Uh, they all have events to raise money, and we wouldn't want to do anything that would uh, right. But restrict I think that they're not seeking. In most cases, they're not having to seek zoning permits related to large like field <laughs> events and that kind of thing. I mean, to me, just to cut to the chase, the event at Eldon Farm required a permit. Um, from the applicant. The applicant, it was unclear who the applicant was. An individual came in, another individual came in, 
and it wasn't clear what nonprofit organization was seeking the permit. So I, to me, that seems what we're trying to clarify, maybe even just defining what what applicant in that context means. I don't know. Is that what you're thinking, Ms. Smith? Or? Well, I, I think that it, I think it goes beyond that. I think I think that we need to look at what per property and what per nonprofit do we want to allow? And maybe less on the nonprofit side, maybe it needs to be focused on the property side. Per property, if aligning with a nonprofit, how many events do we want to permit per year automatically? Many localities do have a more comprehensive uh, event venue ordinance in, within their zoning. And it, you know, we have this kind of field party, carnival, field show. <laughs> it's, it's a a little confusing on what is what, and so one way to to go at that is to kind of bring it all together and, and look at it under a event venue ordinance. Where you, uh, I know Madison just went through a big exercise um, to try to figure that out because you could have a thousand acre ranch who is an event venue and they you know bring in. Thousands of people for I conventions. <laughs> and, you know, there are certain things that we probably don't want. Well, let's not go there. Um, but I mean, I hope that's enough instruction for the planning commission. I do, I do believe that that is. I think that will send them in the right direction in terms of, of, of the discussion. And, and uh, I mean, we we have a representative on the planning commission. So if there's any sort of confusion about what we're looking for in the work product, we can answer questions as the process develops. I think we can work it out as long as we can continue meeting on the schedules that we have been. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. And then for temporary structures, um, I think generally this boils down to what structures require zoning permits and which do not. Correct. And uh, every structure in use requires a zoning permit in your ordinance unless it doesn't disturb the earth or require a health department permit. And so most of the, the, the temporary structures fit into that category where they're there's no permit needed. And so I think you could get it, you could require some of these to require zoning permits. Um, but likely what that's going to do is just keep them out of the, the side yard setback, which they already do, uh, because the residential use can have as many gazebos as they want, unless you want to start getting into how many accessory structures one can have on their property, whether they're temporary or permanent. So I'm not really sure how to get at this item. Oh. As I said, you know, I'm getting a, I'm getting complaints from people that live next door to to properties that have had gazebos, you know, very temporary structures, tents set up for years. And, and you know, without much regard for the neighbors, and yeah. uh, it seems like we take great pains to um, and pride ourselves on the strictness of our zoning ordinances. But uh, when you get right down to it, there's a lot of holes in it, and this seems to be one of those holes. We could certainly put a limit on the number of accessory structures, the number of structures, time limits. Those are, I think time limit would be a great way to get to it because certainly if you have a gazebo up for the summer. You know, something like that is would be perfectly fine. But you know, if it's a year-round structure and not cared for and out for years on end, um, that's really what we're kind of talking totally about agree. here. Yep. Oh, just I mean, it seems like just maybe contemplating what additional detail there would protect neighbors from sort of adverse visual noise and other impact. And Miss Summers certainly knows. The particular case that we're right at least i have in mind um so maybe thinking about that as a case study and is that really what we our ordinance intends to happen and be permitted i mean yeah. it's pretty easy to and for all of these changes we need to think about that property owner rights and so they're will be pushed right, back correct. and yep. I, you, I can have as many sheds as I want. Or, I uh, so that's that give and take that every board needs to 
feel out, and every planning commission needs to feel out as you're working through some of this. Well, and inevitably that will evolve, but I, I do think these are things that, you know, if we hear from our constituents on a regular basis, it is certainly appropriate for us to send them down to the planning commission for contemplation and revision. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Do we have any further discussion? All right, Mr. Frazier. Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Parrish? Aye. And I also. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the Board Employee Performance Review. Uh, this is something that, again, I'm, I apologize, everyone. I requested be on the agenda, um, but we did conduct Mr. Curry's uh, performance evaluations last month, and I know um, that, that, or I suspect that some of the board members may want to discuss uh, communications and make a recommendation for uh, regular communication updates. Is that something that someone wants to either take the lead on or make a motion about? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, in terms of Mr. Curry's performance, I, I, I said everything I, I wanted to say in the evaluation. So, um, well, yeah. I did. Uh, in my feedback to um, to the process was that uh, certainly, if the board has expectations uh, for anything, um, very helpful for me to know what they are, yep. and uh, will certainly do my best to meet those expectations. Uh, but if your expectations are different than what I think they are, then it's hard for me to meet them. Just from a communication standpoint, the only the only thing that would be helpful to me, because um, you stated in one conversation that there's a lot going on we don't know about, because obviously there's been a good amount of cleanup and standardization that you've been engaged in. So, for me as a new board member, without the the balancing act here is not to burden you further with kind of make work type tasks, but just to keep us informed of ongoing projects that might not be the hot issues of the day would be some kind of periodic, and this is just my idea, and I welcome others to weigh in, periodic, regular, kind of bullet point summaries of your your own to-do list. You know, things that are you're beginning to work on that are already in progress and things way out there in the future that you've started to think about. Just so that we're all on the same page in terms of the scope of work um, that you're doing on behalf of, of county taxpayers and including things that this board's direction and again I don't want to burden you with the task of issuing you know robust formal reports every Friday but in my mind at least even just periodic periodic updates in fact not dissimilar to Mr. Uh, Frazier's remarks to Mr. Goff earlier just you know some kind of regular standardized communication about what is going on and I think that goes a long way in just keeping us all informed of, of, of the bigger picture outside of these monthly meetings. It also helps with our own planning. So that's really, that was my primary expectation in terms of, of how we could improve our communication uh, between our board and you. Um, that's just, I'm just throwing that out there for discussion. Any other thoughts? I think as, as clear as we can be on the expectation, um, kind of setting the, we want this by three o'clock on Friday, or you want it, you know, on Tuesday by two or whatever, and it's a one page, five bullet points, you know, here's what I got going on, so that you're not spending time writing three pages of information that we're gonna scan over. Um, I, as a board, I think we should come up with very clear expectations. I don't know how to be very determinative on it, but again, referring back to some of my earlier comments with Mr. Goff, that, that exchange, I'd rather know about something before I read about it in a newspaper, and that has happened. That's because he goes to the courts, and I, the clerk's office sits there all day, and I don't. <laughs> we, yeah, and so I don't, I don't know what the time frame would be. It was just my idea, because um, I try to do that in my own profession. Um, and I just think given there are so many moving parts, even in this little county, it would just be good for us to kind of know the scope of what's in progress. So whether it's twice a month, once a week, I mean, I don't know that we have to decide that now, but that was just my suggestion. I don't I mean, leave it to others. Well, what I'm hearing from staff and what I think is fair to staff is that we set clear expectations 
for what we want and when we want it. And I'm afraid if we don't do that, that this will continue to be a challenge for everyone. And so um, I don't. I think that uh, oh, oh, every week is that too frequent and burdensome, or is that appropriate? Uh, every ten days. Every two weeks, probably would be more like it. Uh, so we so we get I a. Mean, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, what Mr. Curry's doing. Uh, he's time I drive by there on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or whatever, his car is there. I mean, uh, so he's, I know he's busy, and uh, I think that if we we got to be careful about demanding too right. much uh, of his time, because without with the limited amount of staff he has, uh, I think he's pretty Could you pushed please, to the limit. Could uh, you sit a little closer to your microphone? Some of the people in the audience are unable to hear you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. You want I'm me to so repeat sorry. that? Oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I think that every two weeks would be fine. I do think that Mr. Curry's uh, time is uh, somewhat limited in the fact that he has a limited amount of staff and he's got a lot of demands to meet. And uh, I drive by there often uh, during the weekend or at odd hours outside of the normal working week and his car is there. So uh, I know he's uh, putting in more time than already putting in a lot of time and uh, so yeah, I, I think that the last thing he needs is another extraneous uh, chore, and I think every two weeks would be would be sufficient. So we we get a county administrator's report every month in our agenda. Uh, so we would be looking for another one in the middle of the month. Is that correct? Well, actually, not necessarily. Uh, but but I thought you mentioned something about once a week. Well, I just was putting that out there as an example yeah, yeah. Of, of one of the frequencies that we could request. Right. I personally think once a week is too burdensome. Right. I think about every 10 to 15 days is about right. right. So how about a mid-month and be... then a mid-month and end of month, and the end of month becomes the report for our regular monthly meetings? That sounds fine to me. And I, I mean, in terms of like a time of day or a day of the week, is there any preference from any of the board members regarding that? That's fine. Fine the, with me. The I... 15th of the month or the next business day? if the 15th falls on a weekend. That sounds correct. And then uh, I think we are all in agreement that it doesn't need to be overly detailed. It can just be bullet points. Is that correct? I'm with me. So we'll look at a, a bullet point format. And uh, a top 10 is always catchy, but certainly <laughs> less than that could be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking something very quick. So is the format that's in the Item coming up, appropriate? Is that the level of detail you're looking for? <clears throat> That's, I mean, yeah, or, I mean, I would say that or less, and then you could just. Less takes more time. <laughs> oh, it does? <laughs> well, it should, I mean. Yeah, it's fine, and it seems like if you, you may be just updating items that have already appeared on the preceding month's report, so it's really just it's just really shipping out an ongoing report twice. And, and I would say I, I understand that, Mr. Curry. I, I know often when I, I do updates um, in my place of business, I'll just revisit the last uh, update that I put out and um, and update uh, whatever's been whatever's transpired since the last time I published it. So I, I understand it. And then certainly if you want to just revise that and send it out for the mid-month report, that would be agreeable to me. I think the other thing that um, has come up on occasion in terms of communication is this there, if there's been a, a notice of violation and zoning uh, issued uh, within a district, if the um, supervisor could uh, receive no notice of that uh, that letter going out, uh, that is uh, a good practice to know if there's a problem in your district. I would say also if there's any kind of um, emergency going on in your district of which you need to be aware, these would all be things that should be brought to, those would both be things that should be brought to our immediate attention. Madam Chair, that's a, a really good point. I just want to commend uh, Ms. Summers. A couple of things popped up in the Hampton Voting District. and. It occurred to me that I benefit a lot just by picking up the phone and calling her. So it's a two-way street. Uh, I think I think 
it would be good to get that information from the zoning administrator um, before something happens. But it also reminded me that I have an obligation to check in with her and find out what's going on in, in my own voting district. So um, based on my recent experience, I'm gonna to try to make that a regular habit. Well, and since uh, the zoning administrator is a member of Mr. Curry's staff, I think we need to be you know, clear also in giving this direction and, and having it be a process that includes both him and Ms. Summers. And that was the case in the example I mentioned. Very good. Um, is that enough clarity, Mr. Yes. Curry? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, do we have a motion on the table? Um, I didn't hear one, but Good. I think okay. consensus, I... Chair Smith, before you do that, I'm wondering if the process in general um, with staff reviews um, should be looked at from a, a, I guess my expectation as the newbie on the board, um, the closed session we had was it two meetings ago, one meeting ago, where the five of us gave you comments, it was two comments per person, that part of it. I would have thought the employee would have been included in that discussion, not done separately at our level. And I didn't know if that's just been past history that it's always been done that way or if it's been considered. It's always been done that way. I mean, I imagine we could do it that way in the future if there was an inclination to do it that way. I don't know what other members think. Uh, I think that uh, are you talking about the actual review with the individual? We had the, the few bullet points that we had um, for Mr. Curry that we talked just together uh, with uh, Mr. Goff, right. um, present. And I just think it would be good for Mr. Curry, anyone that we are reviewing as a board of five, for them to actually hear from the five. At the same time? Yes. Yeah, so in other words, that invited him back into the room uh, for that time. I think that's fine. Like Mr. Curry said, he, he needs to know what we expect in order to uh, perform in that, to that realm. So that's, that would be perfectly logical to me. So do you, uh, do you need a motion and a second and a vote, Mr. Curry, uh, regarding no. this item, or is it, is it clear via consensus that that's the expectation? So, no, the staff review process, that's up to the board when it comes up next time. Uh, and other than that, I heard uh, you want a mid-month report in addition to the, mo the monthly report, and then uh, be copied on notice of violations or other significant events in your district when they happen. That's correct. And on, and on the mid-month report, did we just, I just want to make sure that we decided that it would basically be the same format and you're basically issuing an update of that report because I think if that was the case, you're working within a template that's not going to require a lot of new work product and you can simply update it. Is that what we all agree? It's just that we're seeing the, up, we're seeing the administrator update more frequently than we otherwise would. I think that there's a consensus on that. I'm okay, not sure. So I think consensus is fine. Me. Yeah. Okay, very good. So we have a consensus on that, and um, I think that hopefully clears up this topic. Is there any action needed on the county attorney form? I know that was the topic from last meeting. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I know that Ms. Smith, um, I think with a, a prior member of the Board of Supervisors, worked on a, a county attorney evaluation form. And full, uh, full confession here, I had intended to try to work further on it. Um, I did a lot of editing and meeting minutes instead. So uh, Ms. Smith, if, if maybe I could commit to at least providing my input in the coming month, I would certainly be ready to hand you um, some proposed additions and edits before our next monthly meeting. That sounds good. We will um, revisit it in the uh, context of the September meeting. I think that uh, is all for the update on the, oh, sorry, gotten ahead of myself here. I think that is everything for the board employee performance review item I-4. That takes us to item J-1, uh, the board committee reports. Um, any actions or activities that anyone may want to uh, report? Uh, if I could, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Frazier. Um, been reluctant and I know we need to, to get it kicked back off but the both the rules committee and the building committee but we've just had uh, um, talking about mr. Curry's involvement he's been very active uh, getting their uh, 
generator and emergency services back up at the courthouse and the sheriff's department. Uh, I don't know how many, this may be a segue into the public safety committee discussion too, but I, I don't know if the board uh, members know the extent of the uh, problems that we've had recently. Some of them calls from outside Rappahannock County with our uh, emergency services uh, communications going down. And Mr. Curry's been pretty hands-on in that. Uh, so anyway, um, that quite a few things going on there. Uh, this board had a, a lively discussion with the um, uh, Public Safety Committee meeting uh, last week over at the uh, Company One Fire Department, and that led uh, Chair Smith and I to meet with the Sheriff and, uh, is it Lieutenant or Captain now, Jenkins? Oh. Major. 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 I'm sorry? No, uh, he's a chief deputy. It'd be his wife, Janie. Oh, lieutenant. Lieutenant. Oh. But she's, I believe, in charge of communications, and um, I'd already had this opinion of her before. She's uh, not only very, very well versed in what she does, but she's also very dedicated. And I came away from the meeting very, feeling very informed, and uh, not disappointed. And I think that we're, we're going to try and continue that. Uh, there are some issues with fire and rescue and communications, but it may be, again, Mr. Whitson, a two-way street there. Uh, it seems that we found that there were, uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, Williams is here as well, the, the emergency coordinator. I think fire and rescue has to get involved. Apparently, the protocols that they want in place aren't there in the book. So we've got quite a bit of work, I think, to try and work out there. But again, I, it was a very, very informative meeting. It was only about an hour, 15 minutes long, mostly because I had to leave. And uh, I was there another half an hour to 45 <laughs> minutes after you. It's well, crazy. then it was a two hour meeting, but I had to leave early. But uh, again, uh, I was not disappointed. Uh, I learned a lot. So, uh, that, that is an ongoing thing that we're going to, I guess, try and keep going now uh, with the uh, Sheriff's Office on the Communications and the Public Safety Committee. Uh, of course, Mr. Williams would be free to, tie, uh, to chime in here if he wants to. I don't want to put you on the spot, but we are working on those, those problems that were relayed to the Public Safety Committee. And we may be getting a, a meeting together here shortly. And I did uh, actually leave it with the sheriff that I, I may go back and um, have another visit one morning this week so I could uh, see the facility and understand a, a little better what exactly what goes on in dispatch there. Um, so I do intend to do that one morning this week and get a little more acquainted with that process so that as we um, address these communica communication challenges, um, we're all sort of on the same page. and. Um, and working in concert for a successful result. Um, Mr. Williams, did you have anything to add coming out of that Public Safety Committee meeting last week? I know that we had a motion uh, made and carried at that meeting in regards to um, our companies and, and how we need to move forward. Okay. Very good, thank you. We're working on that, but we, we felt that we needed to be up to speed. Yeah. But, uh, and then so. did you want to uh, start the discussion of the other item that we took a vote on, Mr. Frazier? Or? Uh, I forget now what it was other than trying to put a meeting together with the... Uh, yeah, we're, we need to get all invo on parties in involved to, in together to talk about dispatch, but I think the other... The other item that we ended up taking a vote on is um, at the beginning of uh, this COVID crisis, we um, got into a situation in Chester Gap where we're paying for paid personnel. Oh, right, right. I'm sorry. Yes, the paid people. And uh, that evolved very quickly. And it was, um, I think most people would say it, it was necessary. Um, I know to some extent 
the discussion was that this is kind of a good test flight for our paid personnel. Um, I would say not everyone feels that way, but it did meet a need and, um, and, it, and we did need to, to do something. Uh, I'm not sure it was exactly right, but it's done. And so now we are uh, four months, five months in to this COVID crisis. And um, we've had a lot of volunteers that rightfully so have uh, challenges with their service right now. They're not able to serve either because of a pre-existing condition or vulnerability that they have or a condition of one of their family members or, or something to where they're just not able to run as they normally would. So the ranks of the volunteers uh, that are normally able to respond are very depleted, or they're getting depleted. Right. Um, and really, a, a few companies are carrying a lot of the work. Um, what, what, what that decision did, though, it, it, it becomes a, a three-point problem. It appears that the county, the association, and I guess company nine are all three in violation of the service agreement that we hammered out because there really isn't any any language in there for what we're doing so it appears that we've picked up the ball started running downfield with really no rules to guide us and nothing agreed to so how do we apply that now to another company is is probably going to be the problem And we do have an emerging challenge at um, Castleton. Um, there's, there's not a lot of responders available there. And I want to be very clear to everyone that, we, that calls are being answered, that no calls are, are, are not being answered, that everybody's needs are being met. But now we're encountering a similar situation in Castleton where there's, there's not a lot of folks on hand to respond. Uh, Flint Hill is still on dual dispatch. Chester Gap has paid staff, and um, the, uh, the other companies are really strapped to, um, to make up the difference. And so the motion uh, that carried, as I recall it, from the Public Safety Committee meeting is that we need to move forward with the path that was actually brought forward to this board and engage in the process of centrally located uh, paid emergency response and implement that in the way that it was intended to be implemented. Um, and, we, uh, and it needs to be a discussion and an implementation as soon as reasonably possible for what we had already agreed to do, rather than one-off solutions as problems arise. And please correct me if I've gotten any of the details wrong, Mr. Williams, because I think you made the motion. Please do. Would you mind using the microphone? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so Christine got the motion correct that came out of the uh, public safety committee meeting and everything. Um, basically, the reason the motion came about is because I want to make sure that the entire board is aware that the volunteer system is doing everything they can do. They're stretched to the max. Can you put the microphone up just a little bit, please? If you clutch the handle and push it, pull it up. I'll lean just a little Oh, thank closer. you so much, Mr. Williams. That's better. Fire and Rescue is doing their best with what they have to work with right now. Um, the volunteers, as Ms. Smith and Mr. Fraser talked about, with the pandemic that's going on, some have stepped away. Some have um, not been running as much. We're going to be dealing with this pandemic for some time to come. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk about is Back in 2014, the county paid quite a bit of money to have a study done for fire and rescue service. If you have a copy of that study and you look at it, you're gonna see a lot of things in there that they talked about in 2014 is coming to fruit right now, mm -hmm. slowly in front of us. Um, the county really needs to start looking at uh, where do we go, how do we do it? Uh, there's been conversations about um, Station 9, which is Chester Gap, having part-time staff there due to them losing their um, providers. We're going to have another station that just went on dual dispatch today during this meeting, made the request because they're down to one provider. Um, 
we have other stations that have come about talking about their members are slowly dwindling down. So as you can see this, it's just, it's not getting better. We don't have the young people or the retirees here in the county that are stepping up like we used to have in the past years. And we really need to get this on our radar before, before it slaps us in the face when we're not ready. Um, and I think that's starting to creep its way up. Uh, when we talk about the pay staff at um, Station 9, moving them central to county, there's a lot of things we need to look at that as far as um, managing them, scheduling them, and everything as well. Uh, these are the conversations that we need to start having for it. Uh, we need to have that plan ready. We need to have it on the, the shelf ready to go. Uh, if we get to a point where we have that influx of volunteers, great. But if we'll leave it on the shelf and we'll dust it off when we need it. But we need to start having those conversations um, and we need to start having them sooner than later. Um, but if I could interject, this influx of uh, volunteers, uh, and correct me if I don't remember it properly, but basically, unless somebody's already certified and volunteers with the company, we ain't getting any volunteers because the training has been shut down. So that's correct. You, so, you may get the volunteers, but they're not getting the EMS training because the training is not there. Yeah. They're not able to complete the training. We have several EMTs in the county right now that was going through an EMT class. Um, they basically cannot do their time at the hospitals or ride on other units due to the pandemic where the county, other counties are not allowing them to come in. Uh, Fire and Rescue is doing everything they can do. Um, we just need to really start putting this on our radar because um, I think it's coming quicker than what we're prepared for. Yeah. Um, and I, I, one thing I wanted to add is where we were talking a while ago about the 2020 state legislation, legislative priorities. Um, Wakefield District, I uh, appreciate her bringing that up. Uh, one thing I agree, I think that should be uh, put out separate in there, listed out. And the reason for it is, is because we need to push for Royal, Royal Fire EM, EM, EMS to be able to get more grants. Right now, when we put in for these grants through the state, federal, and everything, we're competing against the big counties. We're competing against Prince William. We're competing against um, Charlottesville, all these other counties to where a lot of our grants are getting left out um, for critical equipment that we need and everything. So that's kind of where I see we can push it because they can help us there um, in, in that area. So that would be one idea. So, so Mr. Williams, it's, it sounds like there was already consideration of having a paid uh, staff out of, the, out of uh, Washington. Is that right? Uh, there, would... there has been no um, decisions actually made. We need to look at these priorities right. and see where they're coming from. Oh, yeah. Recommendations are they're central to the county. Right. Pretty much. Right. And right. usually when you start out and you're trying to help out the whole county, you want that unit central to the central. county instead right. of yeah. north end, south right. end, and all because that. Because to me it makes sense that we go ahead and move directly forward with paid EMS because people, whether it's volunteers or not, they want their ambulance to hit the road when the, when the phone rings. They don't want to wait for somebody to get out of bed and get to the station. And uh, so it makes perfect sense to me to go ahead and, and, and implement that out of our central uh, station uh, and see how it goes. If, if I, I agree, but we have other priorities prior to that happening that you have to put in place right. to make sure that it's yeah. managed properly, right. they have the proper facilities right. and everything. Yeah. Um, that's the one thing I talked about over the past couple years since 2014. Uh, we haven't looked at because in that study you had several stations then that were listed in critical shape or serious condition. Right. And we don't want to be hiring people part time and putting them in a building that was listed like that. 20, right. Right. 2014. So those are the things we need to need to look at. Um, so how, in your opinion, how, in your opinion, do we move forward with this? Through we need to put a, I would say, a committee together to start looking and discussing. Where, where they would be at, which we had that. Um, I believe there was three recommendations provided to the board from that committee that went around, uh, talked to several different agencies, um, as far, and we came back with a recommendation. Um, there's three of them on the table of what we could do. Uh, we just need to know what does the board support on that, and then we can discuss how do we move forward from there. Uh, I think they prioritized them. Uh, that committee spent some time going and on the phone with several different counties, seeing how they've done things. 
The Fire and Rescue has done their five-year strategic plan and turned that in um, to discuss where they're at and what they're going to need in the future. And speaking for the volunteers in the county, when they turn things in like that and they don't hear nothing on it, they're going to start asking, right. why are we wasting our time? Yeah. So, um, so I went down to Madison County and had a meeting with them a few years ago. Uh, and. Um, they have, they have only one company, and uh, they, they have a paid staff, but they also have a volunteer staff, and they work together. And so the paid staff is always there when the volunteers are not, you know, um, available. <clears throat> and uh, so, I mean, here we have like five, five rescue squads, right? And yeah, six. Six rescue squads. And uh, for a small county, I mean, does it make sense that we close down a couple of our rescue squads and uh, and that would help I'm, us? I'm not even going to touch that. I have opinions yeah. on that for another day. Okay. So, as far as so we need guidance on that. We're, we're, right now, we're we're stretched thin with what we have. I'll right, 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 so. right. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll be on standby for any recommendation that you yeah, have. So, uh, there's three recommendations that they had provided a while back as far as where they wanted to go. I think. Those should be reviewed, and we should be told what the board would support and how you would support it, and your recommendations as far as what you think's one, two, or three. What uh, document was that in? Sorry to interrupt. It's the, it's the study. Do you know the study? Was it the strategic no, plan no, document? No, there, there was a um, where the fire and rescue had went around and talked to the other counties and looked what was working for the other counties as far as how they were implementing paid EMS. Uh, whether it was through part-time, whether it was through contract, oh, this is whether it was through 24-hour um, staffing. Is that the report support. that Mr. Bevout furnished yeah. for Yes, us? Yeah. that's correct. The ranking of what, yes. I, I thought at the end of all that discussion we had, we had decided to go with his recommendation and had appropriated monies in the budget to do that uh, uh, to the tune of about $200,000. Uh, a little more than that, it's frozen right now for uh, COVID. Um, but definitely need to move forward with the recommendations. And um, the first step was to get with Washington to see if there was yes. a way for them to partner at their facility, which is not guaranteed. They're an independent corporation, but they're open to having that conversation. That conversation's been slowed a little bit by COVID, and now uh, they reached out to me earlier this month saying, all right, let's have this conversation. I said, well, let's get the radio right. system done, and then let's get this right on top of the yes. plate. Uh, so as far as the, the fire service agreement and basically not meeting the fire service agreement and all, uh, as emergency service coordinator for the county, um, in a way I would have to say I disagree with that as far as where fire and rescue did have people at the um, table, um, the association, when we were going around meeting with these counties and discussing all that, uh, they were at the table and then when we gave the recommendations to the county, and then we were in an emergency situation with a pandemic approaching us, and we know how it goes as far as trying to have meetings. And um, I think where we have some saying, oh, they didn't follow the service agreement, didn't come to the association, that, that, that's a meeting for another day because sometimes the association wants to deal with some of those issues, and sometimes they think the county should pick up some of those issues. So um, it's kind of like we, we talked about with the public safety meeting. Um, it's kind of good to hear both sides. So. Well, if I could make a recommendation without uh, volunteering anybody else, as the gentleman used to live here, he, he would always tell me, never volunteer, but never say no to the admiral. And uh, it's kind of a catch-22. But, you know, I, I worked uh, with, with Supervisor uh, Beniak, former supervisor, uh, on the fire service agreement, and then um, Miss Donahue's on the um, fire levy board. I was just wondering if maybe we could maybe put together some kind of a easy link there with a uh, ad hoc committee and just trying to put this thing together and see if we could start working on it. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea to me. Without volunteering her. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually very concerned about the situation that we're in, and I think the Chester Gap put the spotlight right on to the, you know, you can't ignore 
that it, we don't it, have it was bound to happen somewhere. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to see another request probably very soon. Yeah, it was, it was bound to happen somewhere first. It had to. Yes. I mean, it's just a mathematical equation, so yes. we are where we are right now. Yes. Um, and as emergency service coordinator for the county, this is something that I'm pushing because, like I say, I mean, I'm a taxpayer here, too. I've been involved in fire and rescue for 30 years. I know how these conversations have gone. I've known how we've um, talked about them, and then we left them and come back, and now's the time for us to start really diving in and taking action. The volunteers, are they're holding their own. I, I support the volunteers 100% with what they've been doing and how they've been doing operating during this pandemic it's um it's amazing we're the only probably the only county is with the number of volunteers we have carrying the load during this pandemic and they all should be applauded for that yeah. thank you mr williams and i would just echo your sentiment it was very clear in that public safety committee meeting last week how very much pride and care our volunteers take in the job that they do and we all them owe, de owe them all a debt of gratitude for their service at this time so thank you for mentioning that. Um, and like I, like I said, it isn't that the, the folks that have had to, to take a break really want to. They would like to be serving. They just can't. They're presenting too much of a risk to themselves or to their families. Um, so it sounds like we have an ad hoc committee forming. Uh, Mr. If Frager. we could get together, maybe come back with a maybe a list of a couple of people to help. Well, and I think the... If we could revisit this, maybe at the would the work session be too soon or the September meeting? I think work session, but I think I'm we speaking have to. for myself. Okay, so work session sounds good. We will revisit it at the work session we have scheduled for the middle of the month, and um, and I I believe if I if I, I always hesitate to comment on the um, completion of the radio system install, but it sounds like we may be on track for the end of August. I see we're seeing the light. Um, Fingers crossed. Um, so it, it may be that this is a, a natural segue as we head into September um, for the next thing that we really need to tackle. What's the date for that work session? Sorry. Um, the 17th is, is the Monday that we would normally hold it at 7 o'clock, and we would be back in the courthouse, which I think will be fine for our work session. So I plan not to be here then, but you guys uh, go ahead and do it. <laughs> You can chime yeah. in electronic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I can't thank you enough for all your hard work, and I know you're you. part-time, but good grief, I'm yes. quite certain that you're working hours that you didn't that really want to be. Some of the things I'm, I'm pushing as far as we need to make sure we have resources in play before we, um, Mr. Curry knows. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much, Mr. Thank Williams. You. Appreciate it. Is there any other discussion? Uh, I, I don't think there's anything else that came out of the Public Safety Committee that I can recall, uh, Mr. Frazier. Yeah, I think that was, I don't know why I had drew a blank on that. I'm sorry, but that was a major uh, uh, it, topic that we discussed. It's 5 o'clock. Let's take a, a brief, uh, about five-minute break, and then I'll finish up with the remainder of our agenda. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much that uh, that we were left off with uh, board committee reports and we'd heard from the public safety committee. Are there any other uh, committee reports? Yes, Ms. Donahay. I have uh, a broadband meeting on August 10th. It is going to actually be at Graves Mountain Lodge. And the reason we're doing that is uh, Clint Hyde, who is due to present to us as we have had other presenters. He is from Madison and just finished a very large project for Graves Mountain uh, to the point that he has basically wired their entire um, their rooms and everything. So when they have 2,000 people on property, they have no trouble with the, the pipeline. And when they have 10 people, obviously they've got way more than they need. But some of his technology and some of the way he's done it, I think, could possibly be used at a future point in Rappahannock County. So Margaret Bond is um, putting together that agenda and it will be communicated soon. Right, Mr. Curry, I think. Yes, sorry, okay. I was That's okay. ahead. <laughs> and then the other thing is the Fire Levy Board is meeting on August 26th at 6 p.m. at the Sperryville Fire and Res or Fire Department. Thank you very much, Ms. Donahue. Are there any other reports? Madam Chair, um, I'll just provide a quick update on the um, Park Authority. Um, you you were at the, uh, you attended the last meeting, and um, <clears throat> let me just say, first of all, the Park Authority Board continues to do a lot of great work in the park. It's had the effect of drawing in, a, I think, a lot more heavier use. I think in the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people have looked for outdoor spaces we've seen with the National Park and Rock Mills and other places in the county park would fit into that same category. Um, there's been a very, uh, very robust uh, invasive species removal project going on for some time in the park. All this to say is there's increased activity, uh, a lot of a lot of buffer vegeta vegetation between the park proper and neighbors has been removed and uh, Miss Smith <laughs> Ms. Smith was my witness. There's a lot of tension with the neighbors right now between the immediate neighbors and the Park Authority Board, and that is um, regrettable. And um, one, one near-term practical um, installation that I think uh, we as a county need to do to just return some kind of buffer between the park and the immediate neighbor uh, to the west uh, is the installation of, of a privacy fence along the park boundary that's been cleared of all vegetation. Because with the Dark Skies Initiative and people coming in at night to look at stars, headlights basically are directed straight into the neighbor's uh, property and um, it's been very disruptive. The, the Park Authority Board went back uh, and looked at their Dark Skies certification requirements and they um, agreed to reduce uh, open public access just to Friday and Saturday nights, which will allow the Sheriff's Department to enforce no after dark uh, visitors to the park on all other nights. And on Fridays and Saturday nights, anybody who's there for dark sky related events will have to go through a stringent um, application process involving one of the Park Authority board members. The Sheriff's Department will be notified. The neighbors may be notified if they choose to um, be part of those communications, but it's now set that the only dark skies events that will occur there will be um, public events that are supervised and then uh, open public access on Friday and Saturday nights. And I've talked to I've talked to the sheriff's department; and they understand that. I've talked to the neighbors; they understand that. But the remaining problem is, absent some kind of physical barrier, um, I feel like the tension between the park authority board and the neighbors will continue. And I think it would go a long way. And I just bring this up now because clearly there will be some expense. Um, Mr. Curry has begun to look into it with a county maintenance person just to understand what kind of fence we could put in. We'll have to do a resurvey of that property line to make sure that we're putting a fence in the right place. But I think this would all go a long way to calming down what is a quickly escalating uh, area of tension. And it also, I think, would give the Park Authority Board the ability to do what they need to do to make the park 
the great place that it is without running afoul of the neighbors. And clearly the neighbors are my constituents. I'm also on the board um, or the board representative of the park authority. So hopefully I can uh, do my part to find a solution by bringing it up to all of you because there will be some expense for this initial fence installation. And Ms. Smith and I, I think, agree that that's a start. <laughs> And we may have to take other action to make sure that things calm down. Um, because there is great stuff going on in the park, but it cannot be at the expense of the neighbors, particularly at a time like this when we're all sensitive about maintaining distance and privacy and, and not having strangers showing up in our yards at all hours. So, um, But I don't say any of that to diminish the great work of the Park Authority. Um, really hardworking people. They've used, been using regional jail um, inmates to do a lot of the work. and. I've said before, uh, that's much appreciated as well. Thank you, Mr. Curry, for coordinating all of that. So I just put that out there for everyone to be aware. I think we're gonna have to move relatively quickly on the fence, so hopefully this month we can get some details on how much it's gonna cost and and how to execute it. So uh, I guess one, one thing, you may not need a survey on, on that to put up a fence because you could bring the fence in the property line and that way you could weed it on both sides of it and save the save the expense mm. of a survey in the meantime. Yeah, those details I think we can work out. Well, and I think we had put some money in the um, park budget this year for restrooms, which I, I don't think is really going to happen this year. I, right. I don't I don't see that as being an expense that they're going to incur. There's fifteen thousand dollars if I remember correctly. Yeah, so and they they seem to be. I mean, they voted at the last meeting if I remember correctly to keep the portage on solution in place, um, which I would just would think that would pretty much be for the season. And then in the off season, they have a portage on on site anyway. So it may be that that fence funding could be used uh, or that port the bathroom renovation funding could be used uh, as part of the fence install, if not all of it. But it also could be that the uh, with this new COVID money that could go toward the bathroom, correct? It's possible. I mean, I, they were they were very reluctant to open the restrooms in general, which I mean, if you go to Culpeper, all their restrooms in their parks are open. Mm -hmm. I mean, soap and water and washing your hands is mm -hmm. the number one recommendation. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't really understand that, but I'm, I'm not on that right. authority. So um, or, and I think was there anything else that came out of that meeting that you wanted to report, Mr. Whitson? No, I just I I think that. Um, the key point is that they've scaled back their dark skies events and I think it was a, a prudent and responsible reaction to very valid concerns from the neighbors that uh, they were not being respected. Um, the way it was is people could come in any night of the week um, and that also created an enforcement problem because you have a mixed bag of people who shouldn't be there and people who should be there and it leaves a sheriff's deputy with the impossible task of trying to sort that out on the spot. So. I think it's now from an enforcement standpoint, and I'll be sure to continue to communicate with the Sheriff's Department in this regard, that Sunday through Thursday night, there shouldn't be anybody in the park after dark. So that's, I think, a big step forward that comes from this re, uh, reworking of the policy on, on dark skies. Thank you. Um, any other uh, reports to make for the board committee reports? All right, that takes us to the treasurer's report, and I just wanted to uh, thank the treasurer, Ms. Nick, for preparing our annual report and attaching that in the packet. Did you want to walk us through that agenda item, Mr. Curry, please? Uh, the reports are in their normal format, and um, this is July data, so it's one month into the fiscal year. So uh, not really much there. Uh, the treasurer's annual reports, those are uh, reporting of delinquent taxes, and nothing stands out there. Thank you. Do any board members have any questions regarding those reports? My only question would be when, when, when can we start getting or when should we expect to see meaningful data on, on the revenue side, particularly non real property and personal tax revenue. Um, and then also, I think the other thing we need to keep track of closely would be delinquencies on property tax payments, but I don't think we'll get meaningful numbers on that until just December, really. Yeah. Um, but it, during the interim period, I mean, it, once we get into September, will we be able to start? Sales taxes received monthly, a month behind. 
yep. and meals and lodging taxes quarterly. And so come April, we'll have a good idea of what the first quarter is going to bring there. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, that takes us to item uh, J3, the review of legal matters. Um, Mr. Goff, did you want to make any comments regarding this agenda item? Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Would you mind using the microphone? I appreciate that so much. And I know people that are having a hard time hearing really appreciate that too. Sure. Usually my voice is, people tell me to tone it down. Uh, <laughs> Harmony Manor is over. Uh, they non-suited. And the important thing about a non-suit in an appeal from a decision of the BZA is that that, uh, that, that ends it. It's uh, the same as a dismissal, dismissal with prejudice. Uh, there is no six month period in which they can reinstitute that. So we're out. Kudos to Bob Mitchell, uh, did an excellent job. Um, Capi Alley, um, we were prepared to go forward. Uh, the last top court date and uh, according to Mr. Capiali and a note from a doctor at a hospital, Mr. Long had been hospitalized. The judge flatly refused to hear it twice. He wasn't going to listen to Capiali and then listen to Long at another date. So he said, let's set it out. So that one's been set out into uh, October uh, as reflected in the agenda. Uh, the Brown matter, you got an excellent email from uh, our county administrator uh, detailing uh, what that was, was an argument on on, uh, on demur, demurs, which were sustained, but the uh, the plaintiff was allowed to amend. There hasn't been an amendment so far. I think there's a date by which, uh, some 21 days from the date of that hearing, by which they have to submit and file their amended uh, pleadings. Um, let's see. Bragg, as we had my colloquy with Mr. Frazier earlier, there's nothing that's happened. Uh, we're under a filing deadline, I believe it's August 18th, uh, to uh, have file our response uh, to Mr. Connick's uh, uh, claim for attorney's fees, um, which uh, right before Mr. Luke left uh, the office, he had done a tremendous amount of legal research on the questions that are involved in that case and Mr. Brown and his uh, research assistant, um, oh, his name is Chandler, uh, Chandler Brooks, uh, is preparing that along with me. We'll file it right at the, uh, at the deadline. Uh, let's see. And uh, nothing has happened in the Fraser matter to update you on. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Is there any discussion from the board on this further? Uh, I would just like to complete my discussion of earlier. I went back and looked. Uh, the email I got about the judge's opinion letter was on March 6th from Mr. Curry, and it, that's all it was, was just forwarded the letter. You mean the judge's opinion letter? The judge's opinion. opinion, right. Yeah. Nothing, nothing from you. And then uh, about a week later, you and Mr. Luke were interviewed by the local newspaper, but you still had not communicated anything to this board. Well, what did you expect me to communicate to you? What were you wanting? Just so I know. I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm. I, I don't know why you find it um, responsible behavior on the part of a, a board employee to uh, sit down with an uh, interview with the newspaper and not talk to us. You hadn't even talked to us about it. Well, no, I hadn't. I knew what the majority position of the board was, though. How would you know that if you hadn't talked to us? I've talked to everybody multiple times. You hadn't. You have never talked to me, sir. So I don't know how you go about getting an opinion from the rest of the board, but you don't talk to me. Miss Frazier, you know. So just to hold, hold on a second while we're right. there. You go ahead. Uh, I've got the floor, I, I, I think. But anyway, what we have here is a situation where the judge's opinion says that the board did violate some parts of the FOIA statute, and and he did not rule that they have violated others, or or rather, I guess he found that they did not, and he, he wasn't going to find them though. So we have a mixed bag of a so-called win where the board was 
was in violation in some areas and maybe not in others, but you still did not commute one thing to this board, yet there's ample communication between you and Mr. Brown, you and Mr. Luke, and Mr. Brown sends letters to the former board members about this, but nothing to this board. You know, I don't, I don't know what Mr. Brown has sent you all. Uh, if I, I just told you he didn't send me anything. Okay, so uh, I, I can't. And answer you didn't send me Brown. anything. I, so I'm left to read mm -hmm. your version of the judge's opinion and the Rappahannock News. And, and what difference does that make? What difference does that make? Yeah, I'll tell you the same thing right here today. What the judge found was that they should have gone out into open session and voted on the, the help one of that. That's what the judge found. That's where the violation was, according to Judge Parker. That's all I can say about it. I mean, what else do you want me to say? You know, the letter, the judge's opinion, I think, is pretty clear. I didn't, there's not a lot of Latin. A there, lot of, there's was a, there's yeah. a little bit more to it than that. He found that, that they relied on bad legal advice, which got us to the tune of about $140,000 so I far. I don't recall that being in the opinion. <laughs> so. All right, but well, I'm not going to be grilled by it. I'm, I'm well, see, see, there you go again. Uh, You're responsible to this board, Mr. Goff, and you just walked away from a discussion. I think, Mr. Frazier, to anybody that follows these things at length, um, and I, I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but I think there is, as there was on the previous board regarding these legal matters, that there is a difference of opinion amongst the board members as to how these things should be handled. And well, can I ask might... a question of this board? Well, I mean, I, I would like to finish what I was saying. I'm sorry, but I would. And so, um, as so often unfortunately happens on this board, a numbers game is being played. And as long as three people agree to something, then that is what happens, um, whether it's brought forward in public or not. And that's a little bit of speculation on my part, but it's the only explanation for how things move along. We, we are spending county taxpayers' dollars, and that's the best information I can get. I have to read about it in the Rappahannock News. Well, I think you know that ever since I've joined this board, um, I've been very concerned about the, the waste of money that all of this is and um, continues to be. And um, the fact of the matter is, until someone else feels that way as well, uh, there's just not going to be a lot that happens about it. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Is that what this board is happy with? I will say, if you have a question, ask Sir? Sir, you have, you, I can't hardly hear you and nobody else can, but you have set up that made it to the to the agenda in April of 2017 and then your opinions were overturned by the Supreme Court it was a very narrow opinion it was 7-0 where they said that you were wrong that I was wrong? yes they said that, that you and the, and, and the judge's opinion that you argued in front of the judge that you were wrong that the law actually it said they stated that it foreclosed all that type of thing you couldn't come up with that opinion legally. Um, I don't know. No, because you walked away. You will not finish a conversation where the public can be involved. Well, I think I think I pretty much summed up what's going on here. And I, I mean, I share your frustration, Mr. Fraser. I feel like that. That, that well, but if I could for a second, that opinion from the Supreme Court is is not open to question or suggestion. That was very definitive. You were wrong, and you attacked me previously based on your wrong legal opinions. You set yourself up to be adverse to me, sir, not the other way around. Right. We're going to disagree, buddy. That's all there is to it. No, you don't have the ability to have the right to have an opinion to disagree. The law is the law. What? I said the hell of my down. I can have any opinion I want. I, I think. I think it's. You see where we are, ladies and gentlemen. We have a we have an employee that's insubordinate in a public meeting, and nobody says anything. 
Um, Madam Chair, I'll say something. Mr. Goff is our employee, and I don't think that this exchange is appropriate appropriate way for a member of the board of supervisors to be talking to an employee in public. If we have an issue that we have to discuss with them from a performance standpoint, it should be done in a closed session. So he can be insubordinate to the board I in public. Point. I'm sorry? He's trying to respond to you, sir. I'm asking you, he was just insubordinate, but you called me out. I'm not calling you out, sir. Yes, you did. You would not be calling me out if you hadn't been insubordinate to, support, support, uh, to begin with. I, as a, as an elected member of this board that represents a district, I am not going to sit here and be quiet when an employee is that vocally insubordinate in a meeting and then be called out for it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my outburst right there, but I am not going to allow that, sir. Insubordinate or not, I don't think the tone of this discussion is appropriate to have with an employee of the county as the board of supervisors. I would ask that we uh, restore decorum to this meeting. Thank you. Well, and it all depends on who's on the board, you know, whoever the personality is playing would, would decide whether it's appropriate or not. And the fact is, we don't have really decorum or civility rules. We purposefully decided not to do that a year or so ago. And to its credit, this board generally fares very well. And I don't like it when things deteriorate to this point either. But at the same time, there is sometimes some frustration. And uh, I do think the frustration is counterproductive. Because at the end of the day, if you have a complaint, especially a valid complaint, if it's not expressed in a, in a way that you know, leads to a discussion, uh, and I don't know that that would be critical either. Honestly, Mr. Fraser, I, I, I continue to be of the opinion, as I am on many occasions, that until a third board member finds this unacceptable, the situation will continue. If we cannot have this, I had tried to do numerous times, it has to spill over into the public. It has to. Well, we will be. Um, undertaking some additional employee reviews and um, apparently there's a will of the board to do it as a board with the employee so I would look for it to evolve at that time. I know in the past when you all have raised your voices to each other you have apologized to each other and I, I would appreciate that if that could happen again. Supreme Court came out with your opinion in May, 
they said that the judge's ruling was wrong and the law actually foreclosed on such a, uh, uh, an argument like that. That was your argument that the judge agreed with. Is this something we could dial into uh, either in our work session or our meeting next month? Because uh, uh, honestly, I don't have all the materials in front of me. I've sent it to everybody, and I've shared it a dozen times, and I'm always by myself on this. Uh, this is the problem. Nothing ever happens because nothing ever happens. I'm happy to add this to the agenda item. I find myself at a loss to participate today because I have not reviewed materials recently. And, um, I apologize if I don't remember exactly. But if it's something that's important to you... Well, if only Mr. Parrish was the only other supervisor at that time on the board. And it should not have happened then, but it did. And it has continued to happen for, for months after that. That is the problem that not everyone on this board is treated with deference. And, and, and it, it got out of hand. And that's what, that was the result of that right there. I'm sorry, but I, I am frustrated because it has continued. It should have never been allowed to happen, and I would not have ever allowed it to happen to another member on this board. But it happens to me. I would never allow it to happen to another member of this board. All I can say is I was not the chairman at that time, and, and I, I do recall some exchanges that I, I, I and I don't, not, I don't like this exchange today either, but you know, uh, you all are grown men, and you have to learn to get along with each other. But we allow it to continue is my gripe. Well, I'm happy to revisit it on the next agenda after reviewing the information. I'll send it to you again. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. Is there anything else to say? Well, I just want to say that I thought this was over. I would, the, the judge ruled on it. I mean, the trial went on for two solid days, and the judge made a ruling that we all got a copy of verbatim. And so, you know, the only thing left is Mr. Connick's legal fees, and it's over. And so I don't really see why we're bringing it back up. Now, unfortunately, the hurt feelings aren't over. The, the well, county was no, divided sorry. over it. This board was divided over it. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Y'all attacked me publicly by, by uh, setting your, your lawyers on me? I think, now that you brought it up, what the heck, uh, I think that somehow or another, when you signed that affidavit, Mr. Connick did not explain to you that that automatically makes you a material witness and that you would be subpoenaed. No, I, I don't need somebody to explain that. I knew exactly what I was doing. And, and, and every one of us that was in that meeting had the potential to be a witness. That's right, and we all were. We were all, we all went to depositions, all of us. And, uh, you know, but I was really hoping it was over with because we, we sat through that two days of trial. It's, it's not really over with. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Mark. Because the problems that, that were created by members of this board still exist. Well, we can certainly revisit that and uh, the damages will be uh, assessed or the, whatever the legal fees are by the September meeting. We should know that information. Um, that takes us to the next item on the agenda, the update of county administrator activities. Uh, and that's an attachment there. Mr. Curry, do you have anything to add in addition to what you've already attached to the agenda? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, the building permit report, the zoning administrator report, and the VDOT monthly report are also all attached to the packet. Is there anything additional we need to know on those? No. Thank you very much. Um, that takes us to item K1, matters presented by the board. Um, do any of the board members wish to bring anything else forward at this time? I just, um, I would like to have uh, Mr. Curry revisit what the uh, members of the library board brought to us uh, during the public comment period, please. Um, the, one of the three library board employees, repeat that, library board employees, not county employees, employees of the Board of Supervisors, uh, is with child and uh, that's uh, great news for her and uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, one or more of the library board employees found an executive order from the governor a couple years ago uh, that granted to state employees uh, maternal paternal leave uh, that would be grant is granted 
without impacting uh, sick leave or vacation leave balances. Uh, there was an interest from uh, those members on the library board to make that a policy of the library board. There was a vote taken on the library board and the motion failed three to five. Uh, so it is not a policy of the library board. Uh, I will say that in, in voting on that, um, myself and Ms. Nick uh, were in the majority and I personally stated I couldn't support anything for the library board employees that wasn't consistent with uh, the board employees, but it's, it runs deeper than that. And it's a, it's a significant uh, benefit that I would want this board to consider. Uh, subsequent to that meeting, there was a review of the leave balances for all the library board staff and um, the past director, for whatever reason, uh, did not recognize any leave balances at the end of the year for any of his staff and reported zero, uh, no accrued leave uh, for auditing purposes. Uh, the library board thought it was appropriate to open those books, look back, recreate the record, and have established leave balances for each of the remaining staff. And the particular staff in person has hundreds of hours of sick leave available to them uh, that they can use for this purpose. So. Um, Certainly the Board of Supervisors in adopting a personnel manual at some point in time could include uh, maternity, paternity leave if you would like. Uh, it, it can be paid leave. Uh, you have the discretion to do that. Uh, you have a pretty generous leave package right now with the amount of accrued leave that you allow employees to gain. So if you are to put in place something that richens that, you may want to ratchet down another part. It's not just about uh, women in childbearing years, it's paternity leave as well. And uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's a broad and it's a big issue. Um, so that's, that's what occurred on the library board and the action the library board took. The more minority group, uh, you heard from them today. Thank you very much for recapping that, Kurt. Mr. Curry, that was my, my recommendation, my recollection of the situation was. One question. Uh, being as this individual is not a county employee, even if we had implemented this, it wouldn't pertain to her anyway, would it? If no, but I think the library board would be more likely to adopt a similar policy, and I would be more likely to vote for that if I knew that it was a similar benefit that the rest of the county staff, the county staff was getting. Um, I'd suggest that that the board and the library board um, have an agreement at some point in time to uh, make sure that the library board does have standardized policies in place. And uh, you might even take the next step, step to suggest that they adopt the county policy uh, when you get there. Uh, but there's a give and take, they're a separate body and uh, they, they, different hat for me, get to make those decisions. Uh, but, the, but the county board of supervisors sends a lot of money their way and there should be some accountability. Right. Thank you. Is, is um, given that it seems there was not an accurate accounting of past leave balances, what's the current status on um, piecing together some meaningful amount of leave based on past accruals that were not recognized that in each audit. The process was done, uh, presented to the library board at the last meeting, and adopted, approved by the library board, establishing balances for the two existing employees of the library. So is that employee now taken care of with respect to her I, expected maternity leave? I don't want to get into leave balances specifically here, because I think that's yeah, a private personnel matter. Sure. Uh, but I think that um, she's been here for 10 years, and she's accumulated a lot of leave. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Curry. I appreciate your uh, recapping that again for us. Um, we probably should have struck, and this is uh, just a little bit of housekeeping here. You could just choose not to enter closed meeting. Okay, so we'll just choose not to enter the closed meeting uh, regarding uh, Harmony Manor at this time. Uh, Mr. Mitchell does not need to, leave, to uh, join us today, um, and we will recess until 7 o'clock. All right.